Very good. I think we should start. We have a rich, dense two, um, I'm going to say mornings because I am based in London, so forgive me <coughs> for that ahead of us. I think we should uh, not delay in getting started and uh, my colleague Seamus will let the latecomers in, but uh, a very warm welcome, first of all, from all our speakers, but particularly from me, Monica Bohmduchen. Uh, as some of you will know, I'm the, well, I'm a London-based art historian with a long-standing interest in the visual arts in relation to the Second World War, displacement, the Holocaust, Jewish identity, and related matters. And I'm the founding director of an what turned out to be an ambitious and so surprisingly successful, though I say it myself, um, nationwide project in the first instance, a year long nationwide arts festival called Insiders Stroke Outsiders, distilling, I think I still feel, you know, it's an appropriate term that constant, you know, tension between the two states, um, but basically designed to pay homage and also to look in a more nuanced and detailed uh, and indeed sometimes critical way at the achievements of the refugees from Nazi occupied Europe who came to this country and so profoundly enriched its culture. Uh, the festival itself took place in a very large number of venues, big and small, different art forms across the UK between March 2019 and March 2020. And then of course, COVID struck luckily, I mean, looking back, goodness me, how lucky it was that the festival was nearly over in that form when COVID halted everything in its tracks. And then of course, the logical thing was to go online. And since then, as some of you will be aware, if you've looked at the website and indeed our YouTube channel where a recording of this conference will be available um, in due course, um, we've um, initiated an ongoing program of online events, uh, mostly one-off, but occasionally conferences such as this and more ambitious affairs, um, which have prolonged, you know, given the project a remarkably rich you know, very gratifyingly rich afterlife and enabled us, of course, courtesy of Zoom, much as we're all thoroughly fed up with it, I dare say, to reach audiences beyond the UK as this uh, event so amply demonstrates. Okay, um, I want first of all, or next I should say, to thank Seamus Spark in uh, Melbourne very, very much for his support in this project. It's been very much a collaboration between him and me essentially to make it happen. And then of course, to all our wonderful speakers uh, for being so willing to, to contribute. Um, a few practical matters. Um, well, first of all, I should also apologise. I mean, the time I know is a not a very hospitable one at either end of the world for Jay Winter, I think, in Paris and those of you in Europe. It's actually quite civilised. Um, we've got Rachel Kitchener talking from the States. Rachel, that really is amazingly noble of you. So my apologies, but let's let's make the most of it. Never, never mind. We will forge ahead. Um, very good. So you all know the ropes. If you wouldn't mind remaining uh, muted when you're not speaking, and indeed, given the numbers that are assembling, um, I'd like you very much in the first instance to put any questions you may have in the chat function. Yes, type them in, and uh, then either Seamus or I, um, when it comes to the Q&A, we'll, we'll modern, sort of moderate, uh, monitor the, the questions coming through that, uh, that function. Um, I think that's probably enough by way of practicalities. Um, let me then start the ball rolling properly by introducing our first speaker, Jay Winter, who I'm sure will be known to many of you as preeminently historian of World War I. And Jay, I don't know whether the opportunity will arise in this forum, but you know that sort of shift away from World War I to World War II is something that I think we, in conversation face-to-face, -face, touched on briefly some years ago, but it's something that is of great interest to me, what, you know, what, what caused you to, to shift your focus. Anyway, let me say a few brief words about Jay. Um, He's Charles J. Still, Professor of History Emeritus at Yale University. He taught for many years in Cambridge in the UK before coming to Yale in 2001. As I've already mentioned, he's preeminently a historian of the First World War, but here most relevantly, one of the authors of that important and very useful uh, volume or two volumes, isn't it? Um, publication, The Dunera, Dunera Lives. He's received honorary doctorates from all manner of institutions, the University of Graz, the Catholic uh, University of Leuven and the University of Paris 8. And last but not least, in 2017, he received the Victor Adler Prize of the Austrian government for a lifetime's work in history. And Jay, I'm very delighted that you've agreed to open the proceedings with some, no doubt, stimulating and thought-provoking thoughts on what he has called the stateless imagination, reflections on the Dunera generation. Over to you, Jay. Thank you very much, Monica. And, and it is uh, really a privilege to open the conversation 
very much a transnational uh, conversation. I, I'm here because of uh, Ken Inglis, one of the great historians of uh, our generation, uh, and together with um, Seamus uh, Spark, uh, Carol Bunyan, Bill Gamage, uh, we carried on a project that um, uh, that Ken had been engaged in before he became uh, ill and finished it. Uh, so that is the answer to the question why I'm here, what's, what's a First World War historian uh, doing uh, among you? Well, I, I want to suggest that there is, there is a very much a link between the two stories. I'll come to that in a minute. But may I suggest a, a third category between insider and outsider that might help us discuss this? I, I want to call these people, these, this population, these transnational refugees, uh, uh, internees, prisoners, uh, free men and women, uh, uh, people who are, are neither insiders nor outsiders, but transsiders uh, moving between the insider and outer, outsider state, status, occasionally easily when the boundary is porous and occasionally with great difficulty when the uh, boundary is impermeable. So that my first suggestion is that we're talking about people who have multiple identities and never fully become either insiders or to lose the advantages and disadvantages of being outsiders. Now, that said, I want to draw on two conclusions of uh, Ken Inglis's uh, Dunera project that I think have a great bearing on uh, our uh, deliberations. Uh, the first and surprising uh, finding that came largely from the uh, extraordinary database that Carol Bunyan put together <clears throat> is that only a third of those who came over on the Dunera settled in Australia after the war. And the second finding was that while most of those who wound up on the Dunera had been persecuted as Jews, uh, the vast majority did not identify themselves as Jews either before, during, or after the war. Thus, most uh, Dunera veterans lived out their post-war lives not in Australia and not as Jews. And yet it is important to recognize uh, both the Australian, to be sure, and the Jewish side of the story. I think it's clear uh, what uh, we need to do uh, when following these highly creative people when we try to see how they inflected Australian cultural life and, and their lives in other countries as well. The minority of deportees who stayed in Australia produced a dizzying uh, array uh, of achievements, as did their peers who lived elsewhere. And yet, because of the madness of the Nazi racial project, we cannot ignore or downplay the Jewish part of what we have called Dunera lives. Many of those who were swept up in the ethnic cleansing of Germany had only a tenuous connection, if even that, some had no connection at all to Jewish life. Many indeed lived Christian lives or lives with no element of religious practice at all. And yet, as Jean-Paul Sartre wrote, uh, anti-Semites defined Jews, anti-Semites turned them into Jews and murdered millions of them. The Dunera story is one of suffering inflicted on people for a racial crime many of them didn't commit. Many shared not the faith of Jews, but the fate of Jews. Uh, I think it's important therefore to bear in mind that the arrival of the Dunera and the Queen Mary in Australia and other pathways to Australia from Europe was part of a deep and irreversible change in the history of Jewish life. After the Second World War, Europe was no longer the center of gravity of the Jewish world. Fully 50%, 57% of world Jewry lived in Europe in 1939. In 1945, that proportion went down to 35%. Thereafter, the Jewish population of Europe continued to decline. In 2010, roughly 1.4 million Jews lived in Europe, or 10% of the total world Jewish population. It came uh, to me as a uh, a shock, but one that needs to be registered, that more Jews uh, live in the New York metropolitan area today than in the whole of Europe, 1.5 million. 
what I term the Dunera generation of survivors of the Shoah form part of the post-European, the global history of world Jewry. There were many Dunera veterans who went back to Britain. Some returned to Germany, both East and West. Others chose Palestine. But the Jewish world to which they returned wherever had been transformed. Now, those who stayed in Australia, perhaps a third of all those on the Dunera, joined a growing, though small, Jewish population. Once again, we have to accept the fact that a substantial number of those who stayed in Australia lived, lived no lives, uh, lived no Jewish lives, lived no lives that were uh, self-identified as Jewish. But between 1933 and 61, the number of Jews living in Australia trebled to 61,000. And in the 2016 census, the total population identifying as Jews reached 91,000. Thus, the population of Australia grew over those 30 years by a factor of four, whereas the population of Jews among them grew more slowly by a factor of three. Now, such growth, modest but real, contrasts with the decline in the Jewish population of Britain from 340,000 in 1933 to roughly 270,000 today, a decline of uh, almost a third. It is even more striking when compared with the decline of the Jewish population of Austria from roughly 250,000 in 1933 to 10,000 today. In Germany, the arrival of Russian Jews after 1989 helped bolster the Jewish population. The same thing is true in France with North African uh, Jews coming to France. But in the German case, the number of 565,000 in 1933 has dropped to about 150,000 today. Perhaps a third of those are Russian immigrants. The Nazis therefore won what Lucy Davidovich called the war against the Jews in Eastern and Central Europe. The world of Leo Beck, Walter Benjamin, of Freud, of Wittgenstein, of Buber and Rosenzweig is gone. One way to understand the Dunera generation therefore is to see them as having survived the passage from a Eurocentric Jewish world to one with poles of Jewish life and learning in all continents, but much, much less in Europe itself. It is still an open question as to how to write the history of the survivors. And this is my point of entry through my friendship of 30 years with Ken Inglis. I had long conversations with Ken on this point. Uh, when asked, does the shadow of the Shoah dominate the history of the Dunera generation? Ken's answer uh, was a qualified yes. And I agree with him. And indeed, it was the same answer given by his wife and partner, Amira Inglis. It was a history that could not uh, be avoided. One reason he gave was that the whole structure of Jewish family life had changed because of the Shoah. The transmission of belief, practice, social uh, mores changed after the war. And here I nodded my head in agreement. I was born in 1945 uh, to a family of survivors. And when I grew up, nobody in our world, uh, my neighbors and school friends, uh, had grandfathers or grandmothers. They had all been wiped out. And so had the stories they would have told their, gener their children, their grandchildren like me. Now, my grandfather was one of the lucky ones. He made it out of Warsaw to New York uh, well before the war. 16 of his brothers and sisters were murdered with their entire families in Warsaw. He left me a note, this, this is uh, something I still treasure. He left me a note before he died in 1945, illness, to be handed to me at my 40th birthday. That was the instruction to my mother. And she duly gave me that note. And, Pembroke College, Cambridge Fellows Garden in 1985 when I was 40. And the note said, he hoped I had not in my early years given into the temptation to read the mystical texts of the Kabbalah. Indeed, I had never had such a temptation. He went on, it is dangerous to think you can speed up time and alter the universe. But now that I was turning 40, he wrote, he gave me his permission to read these texts. And he gave this permission from beyond the grave, as it were, because he was dead 40 years. Why did he give me his permission? Because at the age of 40, by the age of 40, uh, we all learn uh, the meaning of human failure. Now, this Hasidic benediction 
I, which I didn't know was very well known in these circles, it was said time and time again, is the kind of advice transmission grandfathers gave grandsons in the old country, in Poland. When I read it 40 years later, I took it to be a message from a vanished world, very much like a note in a bottle thrown overboard uh, from a ship going down. To be sure, Hasidim, Hasidism survived the war, but the Central and Eastern European Jewish world, which had given birth to it and to other elements of Jewish life was gone forever. And this is a foundational fact in doing the history of the Dunera generation. I think this unavoidable and somber reality forces us to recognize two facets of the history of the Dunera generation. The first is that despite all the achievement and honors, all the contributions to social and cultural life about which we will hear today and tomorrow, the shadows still remained. The second is that even when standing outside Jewish traditions or associations, the majority of Dunera survivors knew that their hardships were theirs because they had Jewish blood in their veins. Now the losses the survivors suffered were staggering. Family, friends, Heimat, Muttersprache, familiar landscapes, school, careers, homes, hopes of shelter betrayed by the paranoia of a society contemplating for the first time in centuries, invasion and defeat. And yet like my grandfather, the survivors were the lucky ones. Most of the Dunera generation started their post-war lives mourning others. Everyone lost someone. In trinkets, photographs, and other objects, they brought with them the few traces of the domestic world they had left behind. Like the Japanese miniature statuettes of which Edmund Duval writes in The Hair with Amber Eyes, they tell a bittersweet story of survival, nostalgia, and loss. What carrying these objects and these memory does to people uh, remains an open question. Many in the Dunera generation suffered because they were frog marched into the Jewish world, whether they liked it or not. I was very keenly aware of this in reading the wonderful biography of Ludwig Hirschfeld Mach that Rezi uh, Schwarzbauer with Chris Bell has. Uh, has recently produced, and I congratulate these authors with a, for a marvelous achievement. This is the story of uh, Ludwig uh, Hirschfeld uh, Mach. Uh, and yet, he and others shared the complicated fate of what Isaac Deutscher, uh, the Polish historian and journalist, termed non Jewish Jews. Most of those on the Dunera had no wish to take part in Jewish life or to live according to Jewish customs and traditions. We know the beginning of their story. They had been trapped in the Third Reich, escaped to Britain, and then they had been interned and sent by ship in submarine infested waters uh, to Australia. Now this uh, meeting is dedicated to exploring what they did then and thereafter. And I would like to express my personal gratitude to Monica Baum Dushan and her colleagues for providing a framework for a discussion of the cultural life of people uh, turned prisoners uh, and frequently turned into forced migrants. That is what the Dunera, Dunera boys were. They were not refugees, they were stateless people. Now as such, they were part of a large population of the stateless scattered across Asia and the Pacific and the Antipodes. No one knows precisely how many there were. Some groups are better known than others. They were roughly 20,000 German and Austrian Jews, all stateless, living in Shanghai during and after the Second World War. The Northern Chinese city of Harbin was in many ways a Russian city. The Northern, uh, the others wound up in the Philippines before coming to Australia. So I'd like to suggest that examining the predicament and the achievements of the stateless may throw considerable light on what the Dunera generation accomplished. That's why I use the term the stateless imagination in my title. Now statelessness is a form of social and political exclusion inflicted on German Jews after 1935 and on Austrian Jews after Anschluss in 1938. It entailed loss of citizenship or loss of standing with respect to the state and its powers to protect its constituents. And that was true from 1933 and certainly from 1935 on. But in 1941, Germany, 
or German and Austrian Jews lost their right to nationality, not citizenship. That is, they were cast out from the German nation on racial grounds. Having neither citizenship nor nationality, these people were stateless. By the time they sought a safe haven in Shanghai in the early 1940s, they were no longer refugees. They were stateless people. The passengers on the Dunera were treated, and I would say mistreated, because they were German. But soon enough, they shed that title. The Germans took it back. They were stateless. Now, these were people were not the first nor the last to endure this loss of a bond with the other members of a state or a nation. White Russians who fled Russia during the revolution and civil war period were stripped of their citizenship by the Bolshevik regime in 1921. Two years later, over 1 million Greek Orthodox citizens of Turkey were stripped of their citizenship. Roughly 400,000 Muslim citizens of Greek were stripped of theirs too. The moment they left their country of residence, they automatically severed all ties with it. They were stateless. Though the pain of dislocation, or what I call the stain of statelessness, lasted for decades, and according to some to this day. Now, refugees flee a country whose citizenship they enjoy, but whose protection they either lack entirely, or whose political and legal system they fear sufficiently to refuse to exercise their right of return. Uh, what happens when a state refuses to recognize that you're even part of the nation, then you become stateless. After the Treaty of Lausanne of 1923, the new Turkish government invited survivors of the Armenian genocide to return to Republican Turkey. Those scattered throughout the Middle East and later throughout the world refused the offer. And aside from those willing to join the Armenian Soviet Socialist Republic, then two years old, these refugees became stateless. The offer of shelter, which is what refugee status means, the offer of shelter was not worth the paper on which it was written. For Armenians, the pathway to citizenship in a host of countries was also an escape from the stigma or the stain of statelessness. It would be very interesting, by the way, to compare the artistic contributions of Armenians uh, to those of uh, German uh, and Austrian citizens scattered around the world. To borrow a phrase from novelist Ariana Neumann, Statelessness is a condition during which time stops, political time, the time of political and legal protection. Now, Hannah Arendt, herself made stateless by the Nazis, took statelessness to be a terrifying injury. To Arendt, statelessness described a condition of alienation and homelessness more fun foundational, more fundamental than any legal category. To lose one's nationality automatically cast one out of the sphere of politics and therefore out of the sphere of social and economic networks that make daily life possible. And that meant a pariah life in the interwar years and after, marked by what George Mossy called the nationalization of the masses. Stateless people were denationalized, deprived of shelter. They were the model for Agamben's category of people whose attributes were limited to bare life, which for millions was no life at all. Ta'ana are at stateless people lack the right to have rights. This is a celebrated and profoundly important claim in democratic theory and in cultural history. But the question I think that we address today uh, and tomorrow, and that I think informs my uh, understanding of the artistic achievements mm -hmm. of the population we study is, is this, is Hannah Arendt's yeah. statement true? Are the people we are going to discuss stateless, did they suffer from it? I want to suggest that we place the Dunera story in a comparative framework. Even when we examine it on its own, we can see that, that Hannah Arendt uh, was, was completely wrong. Those made stateless did not lose all elements of social or political agency, but themselves fashioned a kind of sociability with informal but real rights attached to it. Statelessness, and here I, I do link up with some of the work of, uh, of our chairman, uh, Monica, Statelessness was a spur to creativity. Klaus Lowald, a Berlin-born inmate of Tatura, called this kind of activity building little republics, constructing islands of sanity and participatory democracy in a world of incarceration. The project the late Ken Inglis began two decades ago showed how stateless and imprisoned people could construct below the level of state sovereignty 
domains of autonomy wherein unfree men and women retrieved and reconstructed forms of social and political rights worthy of the name. Now, was the freedom to reconstruct a modicum of rights a reflection of the liberal nature of Australian society and Australian imprisonment? Perhaps. But the search for rights by these stateless men began on the Denera itself under British jurisdiction. One of the most striking documents we reproduced verbatim over seven pages in volume one of Dunera Lives is the draft constitution produced on the boat and written in pencil in German on toilet paper. It was the work of three young intellectuals, Gerd Buchdahl, Peter Herbst, and Peter Laska, who took statelessness to be a condition, indeed the moment for the assertion and reconfiguration of rights. Pace Hannah Arendt, these men acted like shop stewards in a rather unusual factory asserting their rights and obligations in a complex document on work and wages and authority. Of course, they didn't control the Dunera and they didn't control the camps, but they insisted on the fact that once they got on dry land, they had the right to organize and to a degree control their own lives. And when they got around to it after their arrival in Australia, the inmates of Hay and Tatura did indeed organize and operate a parliament, a kind of executive, a talking shop and a great deal of cultural uh, work that followed. Once again, the question arises as to whether the new freedoms came out of the time and security of incarceration. Now this paradox is similar to one of Antonio Gramsci's celebrated claims that the more his physical space contracted in one of Mussolini's prisons, the wider his intellectual horizons became. These prisoners were in no danger of attacks from any of the of the Japanese or the multiple warring armies in China, as were the free men and women of Shanghai. Having their material needs met by the Australian jailers and met pretty well, and having been looked after by their jailers who were by and large decent men, having no claims on their time, the Dunera prisoners had the chance to fashion, even in a small way, their own social world, their own cultural world, which to a significant degree they ran by themselves. Now consider once again the contrast between those unfree, incarcerated in Hay and Tatura, living behind barbed wire, and those German and Austrian people living freely in Shanghai. The harsh material realities of freedom in Shanghai, earning a living, finding food, shelter, dominated, sometimes crushed their daily lives. The unfree, Dunera internees were freer to live creative lives than were the free German and Austrians in Shanghai living without restrictions, at least until mid-1943. With luck, imprisonment, though never a preferred option, can be a creative moment. We must bear in mind that most of the Dunera internees were young men, some very young. Some had begun their professional lives before the war, like Hirschfeld Mach, Others were just beginning to harness their talents. The astonishing array of academic lectures arranged in the internment camps in the Collegium Tatorense show both sides of the story. I look forward to hearing more about what came after. My point today is really a simple one. Statelessness is a condition, the remedy for which the stateless themselves configured. They had help. Now, their return to autonomy and freedom dependent on agents of empathy, on individuals and groups whose intervention on behalf of the stateless ensured their survival. And I'd like to pose that question to the speakers who follow me. Who helped these people regain their lives? They are part of the story. These advocates were a very mixed group of people, doctors, nurses, administra administrators, soldiers, bankers, diplomats, businessmen, international civil servants, clergymen, members of religious orders or sects, Quakers, artists, writers, poets, teachers, spies, and more. Their room for maneuver, of course, differed in Melbourne, Sydney, Singapore, Shanghai, and Harbin, but in each of these cases, and in many others too, the stateless were never abandoned completely. Agents of empathy, like Laura Margolis of the Joint Distribution Committee assumed that the Jews of Shanghai had rights 
and that the Joint Distribution Committee was there to find the means to realize them. Further afield, the Japanese diplomat, Chiuna Sugihara, in Vilna, in Poland, Lithuania, issued transit visas to thousands of Polish Jews and others, including the entire population of one large yeshiva, the Miri yeshiva, who thanks to Sugihara made it to Shanghai by traversing Siberia and Japan. Thanks to a Dutch consul in Vilna, their final destination was set as the Caribbean island of Curaçao, but Shanghai was as far as they got. And that was far enough from the Nazis to ensure the survival of all of them. Theirs was the only great Polish yeshiva, House of Learning, which survived the Nazis intact. Other agents of empathy made it possible for a group of about 200 Tatura internees to eat kosher food and lead a Jewish life. That was a great surprise, came as a great surprise to me. It couldn't have been done without agents of empathy. Who were the agents of empathy in the story that we'll hear today and tomorrow? Now, these allies outside the barbed wire help negotiate the boundaries between outsiders and insiders and make the Donora people what I call transiders, sometimes insiders, sometimes outsiders, sometimes both. After Pearl Harbor, I think there occurred a sea change in Australian attitudes before the division between outsider and insider put the Donora people on the outsider side. But with Pearl Harbor, everything changed. The manpower shortage that followed the British and American declaration of war in the Pacific uh, changed everything. So what could the Dunera people do? They could work as fruit pickers. They could agree to go back to Britain to serve in a non-combat unit there. And then they could agree to serve in a similar unit in the Australian army. Now these stateless men, these prisoners, discovers that they had a right to join up which is far from Arendt's claim that they had no rights at all. By putting on a uniform, many of them shed their stateless status. That is how they move from being outsiders to being at least temporary insiders in the Australian war effort. And in the Dunera Lives in volume two, we reproduce photographs of some of these newly minted soldiers proudly wearing the Australian slouch hat. They were led by a man who moved back and forth between outsider and insider to outsider again. He's the ultimate transsider for me. The first profile in the second volume of Dunera Lives was that of Tip Broughton, commandant of the 8th Employment Company and friend to dozens of the Dunera prisoners. He was a Maori outsider, a man who knew all about racial prejudice. He was shocked to hear what the Dunera men under his command had to go through and was a surrogate father to a number of them. Intriguingly, his days as an insider came to an end when the war ended. He then went back to betting on the horses, poverty and loneliness. A Maori Schindler with a big heart. He was an agent of empathy. Another agent of empathy was Julian Layton, a British stockbroker sent by Churchill to clear up the mess he had created, he, Churchill, had created. And he, Layton, gave stateless people rights to have an advocate. Layton served as something like the Dunera internee's lawyer and got into all kinds of spats with officious Australian soldiers, with a higher rank than his almost always, determined to make their lives and his life miserable. Let us never forget that part of the military. The right to have an advocate to cut red tape should never be undervalued. I tried to suggest that statelessness, the liminal position of the people we're talking about today and tomorrow, was a house of many mansions, a space in which loneliness and bitterness existed alongside creativity and an in, in, inextinguishable restlessness and desire to reaffirm the humanity of those who were victims of a monumental injustice. Being stateless was for many people a precarious but fertile state. Seeing it this way enables us to add the story to that story, a history of the agency of the stateless themselves, the remarkable record of activity, including the cultural activity we shall see in retrieving their rights to have rights. 
The task of future research, I think, is to show how the stateless carved a path out of statelessness themselves all over the world. This is a comparative story that needs telling. These people were not solely the objects of empathy or philanthropy or humanitarian aid. They were the subjects of their own survival. In the post-1945 years, these men and women became citizens again, a third of them Australian citizens. Some left their old identities behind them. Now, self-fashioning, uh, I believe, is one of the arts of freedom. Others lived a kind of palimpsest life in which one identity is written over another, traces of which occasionally become visible. And a third group learned to live on the hyphen, as it were, like Greek Australians, like my friend Joy Demusi, or Irish Australians, uh, like Sheila Fitzpatrick for whom the balance between the two identities is a matter of pride. The term Dunera Australians has a nice ring to it. It suggests something of my central point, that being stateless on the Dunera or afterwards was the start of something they themselves created. The story of creativity is the story of survival. They endured and they prevailed. And for that, they deserve our attention and our respect. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jay. As fully expected, that was wonderfully eloquent and uh, extremely thought provoking. Now, I'm just wondering, and there was so much to digest there, if anybody has any <coughs> questions they'd like to put to Jay right away, um, I think we do have time to take a few. Um, let me just um, go back to gallery perhaps um, here. Uh, if not, I'll just give you a few minutes to ponder that possibility. Um, perhaps we should indeed now shift the focus from the very broad ranging and general to the very specific and hand over to Seamus Spark, who's going to be in conversation with Rachel Kitzinger, the daughter of the very eminent immigre, once refugee art historian. So I'm looking at the chat. I think nothing's coming in for the moment. So. I can't believe there aren't any <laughs> reactions to Jay's presentation, but let's perhaps leave it for the moment and Seamus, I'll hand over to you. Can I just say actually just one very practical thing? Again, you probably all know the ropes regarding Zoom, but I'd strongly suggest that when somebody's speaking, you put it on speaker view. And what I'm going to do now is um, um, spotlight both Seamus and um, Rachel so you can see them both on the screen simultaneously. But speaker view is, is the way to go. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Monica. And uh, welcome to, to Rachel. Uh, I've had the pleasure of meeting Rachel uh, before and um, we've corresponded over the years and I'm absolutely delighted, Rachel, that uh, you've agreed to do this session, especially at 5 a.m. in the morning. So thank you very much. It's great to see you again, Seamus, and to be part of this um, wonderful conversation, I hope. Uh, about something that was hugely important in my father's history and passed down um, in many ways to my brothers and myself. So it's great to be here. Thank you for organizing. Thank you. Um, your father, uh, Ernst Kitzinger, took his PhD in art history in his home city of Munich. He moved to Britain in 1935, he was not yet 23, so he'd completed a PhD before he was 23, and he found work at the British Museum where he excelled. After emigration to the States in 1941, he cemented a position as one of the world's leading art historians. His professional career culminated in his appointment to a chair at Harvard. In preparing for this session, I read a piece on the Harvard website about your father, and it did exactly as I have just done. That skipped from his time in Britain uh, to 1941 and the United States. There was no mention, um, complete exclusion of his experiences on the Denira and as an internee. It seems that your father kept his internment experience to himself. Did he, did he speak much of the Denira and his time in internment? Uh, no. Uh, like, I think his entire experience between let's say 1934 and 1944, um, he never, at least to me, and I, I believe also to my brothers, he never spoke about that experience. It remained a kind of 
atmosphere in our house and a hidden history. Um, but there are, I think, three stories that that did come from him while he was still alive. Um, the first was about um, actually a, a tiny story about his his trip on the Denera. When I uh, received tenure, um, he gave me a ring, um, a, a beautiful ancient gold seal ring, and told me that this is a ring that he had with him on the Denera and was only able to um, preserve by hiding it in a piece of stale bread in his pocket that he kept there the whole time. Um, and, you know, as I guess is true much too often, I didn't follow up that story. Here's the ring, by the way. <laughs> I didn't follow up that story with questions. I, I didn't ask him, well, you know, why did you have to protect it? Or I just got a general sense of grave danger that he felt he was in um, on the boat. Um, the second tiny thing I knew about Hay was in a conversation I had with him about learning languages. He just said simply, I learned Russian when I was in, Aus in Australia. Um, and again, I didn't follow that up with any questions, but you know, really what were you doing in Australia? <laughs> or, I mean, I think I knew in vague terms that he was there against his will, but I, I really knew nothing. And, still wish I'd asked more questions. Um, and then finally, I saw before he died, um, a wonderful description he'd written for himself and my mother about Christmas day and which happened to be Hanukkah um, when he was in Hay. And he described walking um, all the way through the camp and uh, witnessing all the different rituals that the um, people in the camp had devised to celebrate whatever holiday they were celebrating, including, it seems, the winter solstice, where they built fires and jumped over them. <laughs> um, and, um, and that description, the two pages of it, um, showed me how acute his sense of the visual was because he describes all the uh, implements that people had invented like candle holders um, out of nothing. Um, and he describes in detail the rituals he saw. And, and uh, it, it felt to me like there I was seeing the, uh, the big, not the, the beginning, but the continuing of the work he would do throughout his life, which is this intense sensitivity to the nature and beauty of objects and how they play a role in the rituals people create. Um, and that, that, that account ends with his standing by the barbed wire looking up at the night sky in a really eerie, I felt, um, echo of the wonderful woodcut by Hirschfeld mock of a man standing at the barbed wire fence looking up at the sky. And my feather's description of his doing that just absolutely is a verbal um, echo of that image. So those are the things that I knew from his account while he was still alive. It's, um, I think you, you shared that document with me two or three years ago, and it's a I remember at the time, I think, sending it to Jay saying, you have to read this. It's just an astonishing piece of writing. Yeah. Um, a remarkable uh, document. Which brings me to my next question. Um, during your father's interment, he wrote beautifully in German and in English, perfectly fluently in English, of his predicament and indeed of bigger worldly themes, much greater than the individual. His words have a trans transcendental quality. Some of this material you and your brothers, Adrian and Tony, have discovered only in recent years. Can you tell me about those discoveries and your responses to reading his words? Yeah, or... uh, um, it's been a really, I mean, it's an ongoing project for all three of us, um, but it's been a very complicated, I would say, emotional journey that 
that I, at least, I won't speak for my brothers, um, have gone through in, in discovering these documents. So there are, there are documents that he kept from his time at Hay, um, very carefully preserved. Um, at, well, not that carefully, actually, because they were just bundled up in a piece of wrapping paper <laughs> and tied with string. Um, um, but also he and my mother who had met, my mother uh, was British and she, they met in 1939 in, in London. So they were just beginning to develop their relationship and they both kept all the letters that they wrote to each other um, while he was in Hay. So we have all of those. So that's another set of documents. And then I have many of the letters um, or read many of the letters that he wrote to various people in England and the United States trying to secure his future. Um, so those three sets of documents um, were what I have been reading um, among the boxes and boxes of documents that he preserved as a record of his entire life. And they all ended up in my attic and they, they stayed up there in the dark and the attic for years after his death until I could face looking at them. Um, and, and so um, they, I think it was the material from Hay that really uh, gave me a much more clear and detailed picture of my father during the war than anything else. Um, because as I sure is true of most families of um, the sufferers of, of Nazism, um, my father never spoke about his war experience. And so as a child, um, I developed my own image of what had happened during the war. And of course it was completely unnuanced and it was just pain and suffering and dislocation. And that, that feeling that he had and my mother to some degree had gone through something horrible was all I could really imagine. And um, my evidence for that as a child and actually a habit that lasted throughout his life was to watch my father at breakfast um, scrape off the tiniest piece of butter from the block of butter on the table and spend inordinate amount of time spreading this butter across his piece of toast. Um, and to me, as a child, that was a, a, just a vivid symbol of loss and deprivation that, that had remained with him. And that was as much as really I knew um, or imagined. And so reading the material from Hay gave me a, a much more complicated and detailed picture um, of, of at least that time um, uh, of the war for him and, um, and a much more positive picture, um, sort of interacting with some of the things Jason said. Um, for example, I learned that he had a very, very close friend among the refugees whose name never I heard, never heard growing up, um, Alex Hertz. And, and I saw a picture in the documents of, of men creating a, a society for themselves and all the enterprise that they, um, and energy they found in, in, in creating fellowship and learning and, and exchange. And that reminded me in many ways of my students on a Vassar campus um, as undergraduates, this immense youthful energy that was released. Um, and I saw him developing his talents as an administrator um, and a, di a diplomat in the documents where, which he kept showing how the camp functioned and his role in that functioning. And I saw him developing his talents as a teacher through those documents. Um, I, um, so, so it was a picture that um, far from the sort of hazy sense I had of loss and suffering 
showed me men um, uh, in a time of huge disruption and, and suffering and pain, creating a world for themselves that was vibrant and alive and uh, practicing endurance and, and thriving in some ways during that time, um, which, which in the end comforted me hugely, um, not only for my father, but also, and now I'm speaking entirely personally, but as I face what's happening now in my country and possibilities of um, disaster that seem looming, um, it's really great to know that people find a way to continue their everyday lives um, in a positive and energetic and creative way. It, your father, um, um, just to backtrack slightly, I, I mentioned that your father was building a, a stellar career at the British Museum. And, and I read the other day, which I didn't know, that he'd worked on the, uh, the dig at Sutton Hoo, the famous, yeah. the famous yeah. dig. Yeah. Um, and then, but by late 1941, which is unusual among the De Niro cohort, he was in the States, was the, the idea to uh, leave Europe and go to America, had that formed before the war, do you know? Or was that no. something? No. No, in fact, when he left Germany, I mean, he had, he wrote his dissertation as, as you pointed out, at an incredibly young age um, in Rome. Um, when he realized that a the monuments he was interested in were in Rome, but also that he really had to rush through his dissertation in order to um, finish it before he was no longer allowed to be uh, in the university. And so he went to Rome and in eight months, I believe, wrote this dissertation. And when he left Germany after his oral uh, that was required before he could get the, dis the PhD, he went back to Rome. And I think, you know, if he was imagining anything, it was that maybe he could be there um, where he had a lot of contacts. And, but his experience of being in Rome at that date was very different from when he was there earlier. And um, it was not a compatible place for him because many of his contacts were, um, uh, Germans, scholars who are working there and who were no longer necessarily as friendly to him as they had been. Um, and there was no way of developing an academic career there. Um, so he just randomly, I think, or more or less randomly chose to go to England. Um, and, and I think probably at that time, he, he really thought that England would be the place he would stay um, and he worked very hard when he got there he tells an amazing story of he went through Paris and then um, um, boarded the train once he'd gotten over to England and he was terrified of on the boat of going through immigration in England and he had a story he'd made up that he had important research he needed to do in England for his for his his work um, and he told this story to the immigration officer and he got a stamp on his passport and when he got onto the train to go to London breathing a sigh of relief he realized that the stamp on his passport instead of saying giving him six months in England had no end date and that was a moment where he suddenly felt well this could be a place for me to stay. Um, he had an uncle who, who was already in England. So he had connections. Um, uh, so, um, and as we may talk about a little later, um, a lot of his time in Hay was spent trying to figure out where to go next, but it certainly hadn't been America that he'd thought of initially. The, I mean, we've spoken about he clearly a father held to uh, held to memories of Hay and the experience of internment. And one of the ways he did that was um, he kept, a, I guess, a visual record, if you will. So he kept an artwork by Erwin Fabian, for instance, um, an artist that was a friend and known to, 
known to many people listening here. And he also kept one of the famous Camp 7 banknotes designed by George Tulcher. Uh, Tulcher and Fabian were near neighbours uh, of your father in Camp 7. So your father was in Hut 29. They were in Hut 26. Do, did you know about those souvenirs? Uh, did you only discover them after his death? Yeah. Only after his death. And they were up in the boxes in my attic. I'd never seen them before. And he never brought them out into the light of day, either verbally or visually. Um, so so I, I, you use the word souvenir, and I think they were much more than that emotionally for him. He, he really, um, they were a record of an extremely important time in his life. And um, um, he kept them uh, from his, in his move from England to America to four different cities that he lived in in America his move back to England and then his move back to America, he kept them with him. And so clearly they, they held an emotional and in, intellectual power for him, um, uh, even though they remained hidden. I mean, they were never on display. Um, uh, so for example, I think his choice of the um, visual and drawings and paintings and also the programs that he kept for concerts and lectures. Um, they were, they, he kept those because they, he loved their design. He loved the visual impact of them. So there was the art historian treasuring objects that he, he really felt gave him aesthetic pleasure, I, I think. Um, and he kept the documents, he kept a whole series of um, drafts of lectures that they were going to print in a journal. And he kept the original um, uh, essay by someone else and all his written comments and edits of that journal and then of that essay and then the typed version of the final thing. I mean, and so there I see the teacher in him. He was developing that already as he was correcting and editing uh, student papers, so to speak. Um, and then he kept um, amazing lists, very carefully drawn on paper of all the members of his hut and all the supplies that they were uh, distributed like toothpaste and towels with checks and dates and all. And so there I see him um, see, keeping the record of his beginnings as an administrator, which he was for 25 years at Dumbarton Oaks and, and a diplomat there. there he kept um, documents that he written, he'd written with the help of others about complaints or concerns that the internees had that, that needed to be negotiated with the powers that be. So um, what, what, what remains hidden um, and which I, I never, I, he ne um, never revealed was, was really his emotional attachment and interaction with, with other internees. I mean, I know that he had this great friend, Alex Hertz, who also went back to England. Um, and my brother, Tony has traced what happened to Alex when he, as best we could when he got back, but we never, and we were in England a lot, we never met this man. He was never mentioned to us. Um, and um, so the, that whole part of his experience was, was which was the actual um, emotional life of the internees with each other uh, remains completely hidden to me. And, and um, is not documented in what he kept. Um, and I, I mean, I wonder if he ever even really understood it himself. Do you, do you think or do you know if you spoke to, with your mother about it? Um, I don't know. I mean, I, she, um, there's mention in the letters he wrote back to her about Alex, for example. And he, he says that he's found a friend who, um, he's 
um, as excited to know as his absolutely best friend who came to England with him from Germany, not with him physically, but ended up in England at the same time. Um, so he, in those letters, he acknowledges that, but never, I mean, I read through all those letters hoping because I wanted to know <laughs> these things um, that he would have written to my mother as they were happening, but he, he, he doesn't write about it to her at all. And then, you know, all those letters were censored, but that would not be something I think that he self-censored them. Um, I think I think we're running ahead of time, so I might might ask two more questions if I may. Um, recently, you sent me a remarkable document, the text of a talk your father delivered at Hay. Yeah. Through discussion of Goethe's Faust and Shakespeare's Hamlet, yeah. he raised yeah. such pressure, pressing matters as nationalism and the place of refugees in a world once again upended by war. I know that you have a view of what your father was attempting with this talk. Can you? Are you happy to enlighten us, please? Yeah. yeah, actually, I was fascinated by some of the things that Jay said because it, it really intersects with, with what um, uh, I think these lectures are trying to do. So, I, you know, the time at Hay, um, other than his teaching and learning Russian and all that, a huge amount of his emotional and intellectual energy was spent trying to understand what it would mean to become part of another country, um, how to integrate into whatever country it was he ended up in. And um, I'm sure that part of that concern was his growing relationship with my mother. So he was also interested in how someone from a completely different culture and religion could possibly um, become um, a partner with someone from a completely different culture and religion. So all these questions really occupied huge amounts of his energy. And so this lecture that he, um, he gave, um, which by the way, uh, must have meant something really important to him because he had written it uh, in German, of course, and by hand, but the the copy I've seen of it, but I think Tony might have the handwritten copy, was a type script of that lecture, which he himself typed out in 1995. So 50 years, more than 50 years after he gave that lecture, he returned to it and typed it out, which fascinates me. And I have no idea why he did that, but anyway. Um, um, so this lecture accompanied a performance of a scene from Goethe's Faust and a scene from Shakespeare's Hamlet that the actors in the, in the uh, camp performed. And then he was asked to comment on these two plays or what they'd seen. And he starts by um, saying that um, these plays come from such different cultures and different times, it's really impossible to compare them, that you can't do that. But then he notes that he believes that in what he's heard Germans on the one hand and, and British people on the other, when they talk about Goethe or Shakespeare, they talk about someone um, who wrote foundational texts for national identity. And that in both cases, these plays somehow captured for the people living in the country in which they were performed, something crucial about national identity. And then he addresses the fact that the idea of national identity is an absolute anathema to his audience, because here were people who had suffered from the abuse of that idea by the Nazis and been expelled um, because they didn't fit that, that idea of what Germans should be, um, and, but then in his typically brave way, he says, but we can't dismiss this idea. We can't simply uh, deny it exists because we've suffered from it. And he uses mundane examples like everyone in the audience will have said, the Germans think, or everyone will have said, oh, that's so British of him or her, right? So in our everyday language, we reflect a belief that there is such a thing as national identity. 
So he goes on um, to actually analyze in Goethe and Shakespeare what he comes to think of as how these texts do reflect something fundamental about who Germans are and who English, uh, British people are. And I, if I can read with just one paragraph where he summarizes the difference, which also um, illustrates um, really his, I mean, he wrote it in German and this is my translation. So, but it is beautifully written, even if you can't tell it from my translation. So he says, um, we all know the striving of the Germans to anchor themselves in an eternal order beyond the earthly. It, it, is, it is as if they never succeeded in finding their way in human togetherness with all its confusions and tragic connections. And as if the floor fluctuates beneath their feet, as long as they have not attached their life and their individuality to the absolute. Not that the human seems perfect to the Englishman, but he does not feel the same impulse towards ultimate clarity, towards the immutable. One could almost say that the English feel good in the systemless, in the not fully determined, in the unordered. Ultimately, one can recognize greater certainty in that which does not need the security of a system, even greater humility in that which does not storm heaven. So in that, in that analysis, I can in some ways, um, and this is probably impertinent of me, hear his struggle to understand his psychology uh, in relation to my mother's, but, um, but even more generally, um, uh, he goes on to say that it's abs and here he's speaking directly to his audience and their experience that um, everyone he was talking to was going to have to integrate themselves into another culture and that it's it's crucial that they understand their own Germanness and um, and that they also uh, approach with um, sensitivity and, and intelligence, the nature of the culture they're entering, and that they not try, and he's very strong about this, they not try to um, become like the culture they're, entirely like the culture they're going to enter, um, not abandon what they understand about their own native identity, um, but that they rather um, explore and enjoy what he calls the possibility of explosive reciprocity. Um, <laughs> the, the tension that will exist between um, who they are as Germans and who they are trying to become and that he sees that as a potentially extremely creative force. So that's that lecture. Um, um, and if I may just quickly also talk about a, a, an equally extraordinary document he wrote on the Themistocles, the boat he took um, going back to England, um, where he was the spokesman for the, for the people on the ship. And he, he's writing privately to himself about his frustration, quite honestly, with many of the uh, people on the ship with him who just uh, weren't understanding what it would mean and the challenges they would face to try to become part of British society. Um, and he, he, um, he, he tries to analyze the attitudes that they, people may meet when they come back to England. So he says, there'll be, there'll be English people who will look at us as Germans and immediately just feel the only good German is a dead German. And that that's one attitude that they would definitely meet. And if in reaction to that attitude, um, they decided to try to become more British than the British, um, 
in order to escape that suspicion, they could be viewed by other British people, or even in fact, he says the same British people as um, doing something false, as, as actually denying their own nationality, their original nationality, denying their, their homeland, denying their own language and denying their own um, culture. And therefore um, the potential of seeing uh, loyalty uh, as part of their character would be really compromised um, in the eyes of some British people. And, um, and so um, he said, uh, really for him, the only way he could imagine making that transition into wartime England successfully would be if there were a organized German opposition to Nazism. So that like um, the Poles and the French who were resisting the Germans, they could, the Germans who were fighting against Germans could say they were trying to liberate their country, not betraying their own country people, countrymen. So in both of these documents, he really um, is struggling with this question that Jay hinted at of how you move out of statelessness into a new citizenship um, while acknowledging that you never can actually do that fully. When, I, when you sent me that document recently, one of the, as you know, one of the first things I did was ask your permission to send it to Jay because I was sure that he'd be delighted by it. Um, the, uh, two things I'll add quickly before my last question. Um, people who are interested in your father's career as a, as a great, one of the 20th century's great art historians, um, there was a very good edited collection put out a few years ago, um, which includes a chapter that discusses your father's time at Hay. And the documents that Rachel is mentioning um, so in an act of remarkable generosity. Uh, uh, Rachel and her brothers have donated those documents to the State Library of New South Wales recently. So they're, they're back, in a way, they're back home, um, as it were. And I see that uh, with us tonight is Louise Animat, Executive Director of the Library. And I know that Louise has been delighted. And I understand, Rachel, that that most recent find is might also be... Yeah, actually, I'm glad... Going to Louise <laughs> here because I, I did want I was going to be in touch with her to say I have this typescript done in 1995 of that Faust and Hamlet lecture which I'd love to send um, to be part of the both Tony and Adrian and I agree should be part of the collection yeah yeah it's it's for people in Australia um, who are at some point in the COVID uh, so foiled, able to get to Sydney, it's a remarkable correspondence and worth reading. Um, my last quest question, Rachel, you mentioned that your father returned on the Themistocles, that, that boat left Australia on 4th of June, 1941. There's an, a remarkable collection of De Niro repatriates on that boat. Uh, George Tulcher, who we mentioned, the Barhouse artist was on that boat, Hein Heckroth. Heinz Hengis, uh, his son Ian is speaking as part of this conference and is with us tonight. And another person uh, on that return journey was Franz Borkenau Pollock, the intellectual and friend and um, a companion of George Orwell. Uh, there's a scholar in Britain writing a book at the moment saying, or and her thesis is that Orwell's position on communism and the Soviet Union uh, mainly derived from Balkan Al Pollock and their and their conversations. Did your father ever mention those names? I take it no, but you not names that you ever heard. No, and it and it is it remains a huge curiosity to me that he seems to have. Um, the way I think about it is that his time at Hay and all the people he knew there became a kind of parenthesis, a very precious parenthesis in his life um, that he, he didn't try to carry over 
um, when he got back to England. Um, and um, I know that um, the most frustrating time for him at Hay was after he'd been released and before he was actually given transportation back to England, several months, um, many months actually, where he was still behind barbed wire, even though he was supposedly free. Um, and he was, he was really anxious to get back to his life in England and the life that he had started uh, with my mother and the life he'd started at the British Museum and the Warburg Institute. And um, he was very anxious um, to join the war effort in whatever way he could. And so I feel like the time at Hay for him and, and the people there was a kind of hiatus where he was both constantly trying to figure out what his future steps would be, but also at the same time, and I think Jay mentioned this, um, it was um, a luxury. I mean, it was a time where he was um, safe and he was fed and um, and it was a time out of time where he developed many of the of the talents that he used for the rest of his life with people he would he felt very close to um, and and yet it remained that time out of time that when he got back into um, moving forward um, it, it seems to have um, he left it as a, a parenthesis, a very important one, and one that that gave him the chance to ask questions and to think and to develop talents that he wouldn't have had if he'd been in the middle of the war. Um, but it 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 uh, didn't carry over into his life when he got back to England in any way uh, that I can think. I like the term used there, parenthesis. I think it's something can, that can be applied to so many De Niro stories. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I think uh, on that note, thank but can you. I for... Say one more thing. Um, of course, yeah. I can't say um, strongly enough how, how wonderful it is for all of this history to be coming to light through your work and other works, other people's work. Uh, as I say, for me and my brothers, it, it, it's a story that was hidden and it belongs in the light. And it's, it's, you know, since we started looking at these documents, my brother in New York has Erwin Fabian's watercolor of a soccer game in Hay on his wall. And I have um, a wonderful surrealist painting by Hein Heckroth of, um, uh, on a, a piece of building material, as far as I can tell, um, that I now have upstairs in my landing that I see every day. And so the, the fact that all of this material is coming to the light is just fantastic. And I really wanna thank everybody for doing that. It feels great. Thank you, Rachel. Um, if one minute for a personal indulgence. One of the things that I've loved about the De Niro diaspora over the years. One of my favorite memories is having dinner in uh, your brother's house in Harlem in New York and looking at an Owen Fabian on the wall. Yeah. And I thought that's just wonderful. <laughs> um, to, to my mind, in some way, the essence of um, a wonderful community and story. Uh, thank you very much, Rachel, especially, I know it's very early where you are, and I'm um, delighted to have you join us, so thank you. Thanks. Wonderful, and let me add my thanks, Rachel, to you especially, and also to Seamus, that was a wonderfully engaging uh, interchange of, of thoughts and ideas and uh, memories. Um, I'm just wondering how best to proceed. We have one or two very practical questions, but I think perhaps before we address those, I wonder, Jay, who I've now spotlighted so everybody can see you to the same size on the screen, whether you'd like to respond to this conversation or into the conversation. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, very briefly, um, I've always believed that uh, all families are defined by their silences, by the things that they don't talk about. And uh, having been part <laughs> of a, 
a world where the silences are deafening, that they simply, they cannot be uh, either ignored or uh, replaced. Uh, that the, the notion of silence doesn't mean forgetting. It means um, sometimes a very important emotional attachment to events that are uh, very difficult to integrate. Uh, into the world. And the, the one suggestion I have, I don't know if this has any bearing on you, Rachel, is I found that um, grandparents um, uh, are very good communicators, not to their children, but to their grandchildren. Uh, and that it's easier for sometimes for grandparents mm -hmm. to tell stories about the war to their grandchildren than to that difficult generation in the middle. Uh, so the, seeing the transmission of memory as a three generational matter, uh, might separate some stories of the Dunera that are told to grandchildren from those um, families where that transmission doesn't happen. As I understand in your case, uh, your father was uh, very much uh, a man who guarded these moments as privileged and precious in his life rather than telling them to anybody. But there are other families where the stories come out in a delayed fashion, uh, but not necessarily to the children who after all want to become the new identity that their parents uh, chose for them. I wonder perhaps I could add to that by saying that in those cases where the stories are not told face to face, even to the next generation on, it's a very common uh, phenomenon, Rachel, and I'm sure you might really have to tell you this, that actually it is only after the parent's death, yes, that caches of material are found in an attic or wherever they happen to be in, and that process of excavation, often very emotional, intensely emotional, is able to take place. It's a very, very common phenomenon, but one that you know, badly needs to be done and is, is being done, is being done indeed. Um, right, let me just look at the chat. And as I say, there are a few um, quite practical questions here. Um, okay, let me answer this one question straight away. Um, Diana da Costa asking about the availability of the conference. Yes, it is being recorded and I'm keeping a careful eye on the technicalities there. And the recording will be uploaded in due course on the Inside is Outside is YouTube channel, which can easily be found by doing a Google search. Um, but also I imagine Seamus and indeed the other speakers will have their own sort of outlets for making the uh, recording available. So yes, um, the edited, it, Edition, the edited collection that was referred to. Um, yes, Carol Bunyan has actually typed that in, so I don't think I need to um, go over that. And then a question from Alan, who will be speaking shortly. Um, does Rachel know of her father's connection with George Telcher and the Hay Camp Seven Banknotes? What do we know about that relationship? Um, all I know, um, um, and um, I think Tony, my brother in England, is actually also in the audience. So Tony, if you can say more, please unmute yourself and say it. But um, um, we, he did preserve one of those banknotes um, in the, in the, in his collection. Um, and um, it obviously was another one of these visual objects that really moved him and pleased him aesthetically. Um, well, it'll be something I will be talking about later, but um, obviously I suspect you're not aware of the fact that your father's name was hidden in one of the sheep on the back of the banknotes. No, I had no idea. Um, <laughs> and that is that is quite common um, <laughs> with, with people. Uh, George Telcher never told people um, whose names, he'd, he'd hidden the names of <laughs> artists, um, uh, fellow artists in the camp, um, but also a lot of his friends from Hut 26. So your father's name is, is one of those. Uh, I'll be briefly alluding to others um, in, my, in my talk, but I suspect if he kept the two shilling note, um, the um, serial number will be E39927. Well, uh, uh, my, so... brother, my brothers and I decided um, not to send that note uh, with the other documents to New South Wales, but instead to um, sell it in order to give the proceeds to a refugee organization that was supporting um, current refugees. Um, All right. Okay. Well, uh, in, which, in which case I'll look up my records. I might find it um, as having appeared on the market. But um, uh, that that serial number will have corresponded to his inter uh, his Australian internment number. Fantastic! Thank you for that. It's really fascinating. Lovely. That's the first of I 
suspect quite a few little revelations or possibly big revelations that are going to uh, appear in the course of today and tomorrow. Wonderful. Uh, also, Rachel, I'm immediately struck by what you said about wanting or being prepared to sell that banknote to help refugees now. And I think that's terribly important. And again, I think something that will be a recurring refrain, the links between past and present that Jay was also talking about. Um, Jay, I have quite a few questions of a sort of rather large nature, which I think perhaps we should reserve to the concluding discussion or perhaps, uh, yes, to sort of later in the proceedings. But I was also struck, Rachel, by what you were saying about your father's attempt during internment or indeed on the ship back, I think, if I've got that right, um, to establish you a German identity versus a British identity. In a way, I find that quite surprising because somebody of such immense intelligence as your father evidently was to still kind of hold fast, and perhaps Jay, you'd like to comment on this, to the notion of some kind of monolithic homogeneous German identity, given what had happened to him and his experience of being a, a Jew in Nazi Germany, uh, albeit one who escaped, seems to me quite, quite curious and, and interesting. Yeah, I mean, I understand it as part of his really scrupulous intellectual honesty. I think he, he really wanted to understand the ways in which the way he had been brought up as a German had had created his character um, outside of his family context um, just because he was German. And he, he really felt he needed to understand that in order to be able to move forward and to live in another culture. And, you know, it's a it's an it's a question I don't. I don't know how this happened, but it's something I've thought about a lot without knowing that that was something he was um, deeply concerned about because, because um, you know, this whole question of whether there are, there are characteristics that uh, we, we attribute to nationalities and, and really think are there, um, it doesn't go away that idea, no I, matter how it's been abused. It, can it I really, second that? Yeah. It's a very, very profound remark, uh, mm -hmm. Rachel, because, um, mm -hmm. well, two, two parts of it. I, th I was thinking of, of your dad when I tried to invent the term uh, uh, transider, yeah. because it's not a stable position. Right. You could be British on Monday, Wednesday, between three and five, and German on Tuesday and Thursday at uh, right. other hours, and something of, a, of an amalgam between. Uh, what, I, what I think matters, perhaps you could comment on this, the, the profound origins of art historical scholarship in Germany must have had a bearing on the way he developed his work. He wasn't only a German art historian, but German art history is foundational in so many profound ways uh, and was indeed in his, in his doctorate, which, which I, I've read it uh, at my, my great pleasure. Uh, so it, to some extent, it matters what field you're in. And as, a, as an art historian working in the United States at Harvard, which is entirely a transnational institution, um, the concept that you can actually be one um, person uh, with one national um, uh, face to show the world um, is, is something that I've never really come across before. Uh, the idea of being insider and outsider is, an, uh, is a, 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 a lifetime struggle uh, to find the third way, if I can, if I can use that, uh, that phrase. Uh, and sometimes it's very uncomfortable. It can be painful uh, to, to live in this, uh, in this unstable environment. Uh, and I, 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 I read uh, the, the essay on Faust and, and, and Hamlet to be um, uh, an exercise in your father's courage. Yeah. Uh, to confront a painful question mm -hmm. uh, at a moment when what the Nazis were doing to the to the name of Germany was to ruin it uh, for generations to come, uh, and to to make that issue of multiple identities one uh, which was necessary for him to uh, recognize and admire that part of German culture that he was going to take with him for the rest of his mm -hmm. life. Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely true that I think he got, I mean, he talks about his way of looking at objects um, as really born out of his uh, interactions with his mentor in, in Germany before he left, um, Pindar, Pinder, um, the art historian, and um, 
and and clearly he sees his own um, seminal interests and the way he approaches art history as born in pre-Nazi Germany. Um, and, and just to tell one quick story, um, when he was 90, 89 living down the street from me, um, the one story that he told me about the war uh, was the horrendous experience he had taking his oral exam. Um, when, and he left Germany the next day and that was it, but he had to pass that exam. And one of the examiners in his minor field, which was philosophy, was a, um, a, a neo-scholastic who studied um, church fathers. And he had prepared assiduously. He'd never met the man for that, in, that hour long exam. And um, all, all the man would ask him was what, was Hobbes's theory of the soul. <laughs> Zero idea, no idea. We wouldn't let him talk about anything else. Um, and so he, at the end of that time, he thought he'd failed the exam, that he wasn't gonna leave Germany with his PhD, he'd have to start all right. over again. And when he was told that he'd passed summa cum laude, um, he, he, it, throughout the rest of his life, and he told me this when he was 89, it still haunted him that he had become a PhD um, and all his future work was shadowed by the fact that Pinder had out of pity given him his degree. Um, so, so there was, you know, he could never escape that sense that his, beginnings as an art historian was shadowed in many ways and formed in many ways by the circumstances in Germany when he left. Mm. I'm looking at the time and I think we should probably stop there. We could go on much longer. What a wonderful beginning. I make it 10.45 UK time. So let us let us continue. Welcome back everyone um, for what promises to be an equally rewarding sequence of talks for the rest of today. Um, it's my great pleasure next to introduce Ilma Martinuzzi O'Brien, Dr. Ilma Martinuzzi uh, O'Brien, who is an adjunct senior research fellow in the archaeology and history department at La Trobe University in Melbourne, for those of us who are not familiar with the academic world in Australia. Um, fine, let me, um, her, her, I think this is going to be wonderful because where Jay's talk was wide open in many thought-provoking sorts of ways. Hers too will open the conversation in other directions. Her, uh, by my understanding, uh, her remit will be to set the experience of the mostly, but of course not exclusively, Jewish refugees from Central Europe, primarily of course Germany and Austria, but to uh, set them in the wider context of other internment experiences by, you know, on the part of people from elsewhere, other backgrounds, uh, to, to broaden the canvas still further. Let me just tell you a little bit about Ilma, first of all. Uh, she's researched Italian migration, Italian migration in particular to Australia, for more than uh, 35 years, an impressive length of time. Uh, she was the director of the Italian Historical Society, where she curated the bicentennial exhibition called Australia's Italians, uh, 1788 to 1988, which toured Australia and Italy, and later with Dr. Helen Light of the Jewish Museum, so clearly already making connections. She produced the ex exhibition called Bridging Two Worlds, Jews, Italians, and Carlton at the Museum of Victoria. Um, I could go on, but I think given the constraints of time, I will leave it at that. And it's my very great pleasure, Ilma, to hand over to you. Thank you very much. Um, yes, Australia can find, I'll, I'll just start quickly because I've got a bit to go through, I think. Australia can find thousands of men, women and children in the Second World War, and some of them were Australian residents and others were civilians who came under the control of Britain in various ways. My talk is, uh, most of my work has been on local resident internees with a particular focus on Italian internees, and there is a personal connection. My mother and I were evacuated from the North Queensland coast at the time of the Battle of the Coral Sea, 
when the Americans came to Australia to save Australia, and my father was interned shortly thereafter. My father, who was born in North Queensland, was a British subject, as was his mother. His father had relinquished his Italian nationality to become a British subject before the First World War. At that time, Australian citizenship as a formal category didn't exist. And my father was variously described as Italian and sometimes of Italian as Italian with Australian born in brackets. For Australian residents, internment, they're going to be the first group I'll, I'll discuss. For Australian residents, internment was introduced as a means of con controlling those with enemy ancestry and associations or associations who are considered a threat to Australia's national security. The reason for an individual's internment was never tested in a court of law and it was never disclosed to the internee. Emphasis was, was placed on interning leaders and prominent community members as a means of controlling their communities and of upholding public morale. On the declaration of war, the internment of those classed, and I say classed as Germans, began. Many were prominent leaders of their respective communities in, in the Australian states. And the German consular officials, particularly uh, Dr. Asmus, had some success in promoting Nazism amongst the German settlers. Internments began on the first day of the war, and among them, Arnold van Skurst, the editor of the German language newspaper. Other immediate internments were members of the Australian Nazi Party and 10 recent arrivals whose citizenship was described as refugee. One of them, Ferdinand Stark, had been a scientist at the University of Vienna before his arrival in Australia in 1938, but he was working as a factory hand in Sydney when he was interned. Others interned in this early phase of the war were well-known Nazi supporters, including Valdemar Weber, my German pronunciation isn't very good, from Sydney, and medical doctor Johannes Becker of Tanunda in South Australia. Members, numbers of businessmen, engineers, tradesmen, and even one retired member of the South Australian Parliament were interned. There were quite a few wool buyers, including a Friedrich Smith, a co-owner of a large wool buying firm, and his wife, who were interned, and the assets of the firm were, in sea, were seized under the Trading with the Enemy Act. Missionaries and planters from New Guinea were also among those interned and many farmers from Australia as well. So by the end of 1939, 423 residents of German and Austrian origin or association had been interned in Australia. When Italy entered the war on the 11th of June, 1940, the, the internment of Italians began with 983 being taken on that very first day. In the case of Italians, Sydney was the, the business, cultural and uh, so intellectual centre in Australia and all the main Italian companies uh, were headquartered there and their st staff members were interned. Italian organisations such as the Dante Alighieri, the Fascist Party, the Ex Combatenti, the Returned Soldiers, the Alpini and other military group and others uh, were all interned uh, while the German community had had a previous and very unfortunate experience of Australian internment during the First World War, no Italians were interned in that war because Italy had been on the Allied side. However, some of the first Italians to be interned in World War II were former Allies. One was Prince Del Drago, who founded the Italian Returned Soldiers Association in Sydney in 1926. He and the artist and businessman Lamberto Iona had been highly decorated officers in World War I, fighting in Northern Italy, when Italy and the Allies defeated the Austro-Hungarian Empire at the Battle, Battle of Vittorio Veneto, and both took part in the Australian Anzac Day marches in Sydney. Lamberto Yonner was a man of many, many talents. 
He was secretary of the Italian Chamber of Commerce and the Australian representative of the Ber Berlitz School of Ma La Languages. And he was an Italian talented artist. He drew a number of cartoons depicting the tribulations of internment camp life. And they're now in the, uh, the Australian War Memorial. Another Italian returned soldier who was interned was Count Piero Lali of Ingham, who had been decorated for bravery by both Italy and France. When Lali arrived in Australia in 1920, he applied for a commission in the Australian Army Reserves unsuccessfully. And he, in England, established the Italian branch of the Australian, the, of the Australian Returned Soldiers and Sailors. But these immigrants suddenly found that their identity changed from being an ally to the enemy. Also in turn from Ingham was Giuseppe Cantemesa. I'm just giving you a general overview of uh, the way the internment uh, impacted on the uh, immigrant uh, societies of Germans and Italians. Also in turn from Ingham was Giuseppe Cantemesa, who'd been elected five times as a Labour Party member of the local government. Another example was Claudio Alcorso, who with his brother and their accountant left Italy when Italy's racial laws were introduced in 1938, and they established a silk printing business in Sydney. Some years after the war, Alcorso became the founding chair chairperson of the Australian Opera. He also wrote a book about his internment. He was in Love Day in South Australia. By the end of 1940, the first phase of the war, a, a total of 4,200 civilian residents of Australia had been interned, made up of 1,800 Germans, so-called Germans, and 2,400 Italians. However, in early 1942, as a Japanese invasion threatened Northern Australia, in the build-up to the Battle of the Coral Sea, a second wave of internments of local residents took place at the height of the panic and more than 2,000 Queensland Italians, one of them my father, and all the Japanese were interned. As the war situ situation in Europe deteriorated, in July 1940, the Australian government agreed to take 6,000 internees from Britain and following a request from the Straits Settlement Government to accept internees from the Straits Settlement in Singapore. They were accepted on the condition that they wouldn't remain in Australia when their internment concluded. The first of the overseas internees to arrive were the 2,542 civilians on the ship Danira, who arrived at the beginning of September 1940. 230 2,344 were classed as German and 201 were Italian. About three weeks after the arrival of the Danira, the Queen Mary arrived from Singapore with 272 men, women and children from the Straits settlements of Malaya. Unlike the Danira internees, this group included families. They were not regarded as dangerous and their dossiers contained no adverse security information and they had been in turn because Singapore was of strategic importance to the British Empire and, and to Australia. And they were considered a security risk in, that, in, in, in Malaysia. The majority were Jewish refugees of German, Polish and Austrian birth, but among them were 48 Italians resident in Singapore and the Straits settlements. The religious affiliation of the Italians was two Jewish and two Protestant and the remainder were Catholic. Among the arrivals from the Straits settlement was the late large Seefeld family from Hamburg who, who described themselves as stateless and the Doldig family comprising two brothers and their wives and children who were born in Poland but had taken Austrian citizenship. The intelligence section of the Australian Army reported that the Singapore internees carried consider considerable quantities of lug luggage, including men many valuables and thousands of pounds in various currencies. As an example, Gottfried Baller brought 16 
trunks, cases and suitcases of clothing, plus household effects, books, one sewing machine and 50 tins of ointment. Unlike the retreatment received by the internees on the Danira, where the guards ill-treated and looted the luggage of those on board, there were no reports of ill-treatment Ill uh, from among by the Singapore internees. Italians in the group were Lloyd Triestino, Triestino manager in Sydney, a musician, a couple of engineers, sculptors, planters, and a surgeon, Dr. Paolo Otto Lenghi. One of the Italian women, Ottilia, Ottilia Reginato, kept a diary during her internment in Tatura, and it was published by her daughters in Italy in, nine, in 2016. The diary details, details some of the interactions between the various groups in the Tatura family camp, such as when the Italians requested a small separate cooking area because of incompatible cooking traditions. There were also dis disagreements between the camp authorities and Seafeld, who complained to the official visitor that the Jewish refugees were regarded not as allies, but as the enemy. The camp commandant responded that they were difficult and disloyal to Britain and dismissed Seafeld as camp leader. Uh, in all the camps, uh, a camp leader was elected by, uh, by the uh, internees. During 1941, more civilian internees were brought to Australia, this time from the Middle East. There were 855 Germans and Italians from the British man mandated territory of Palestine many of them family groups who arrived on the Queen Elizabeth on the 23rd of August, 1941 in Sydney. The majority of the Germans were Templars, a conservative Protestant group who'd been settled in Palestine for many decades. There were also 142 Italians, many of whom also had a long history in the Middle East. They were followed by a, a group of Germans and Austrians interned in Iran, who arrived a year later in uh, November 1941. Among them were a few family groups who joined the Germans, the German group in Tatura Camp 3, which was the, the Tatura family camp. Now, internees in Australian camps were not se separated in, according to politics, religion, or culture. The army organized and classified them into three groups, German, Italian, and Japanese. The group classed as German included refugees, Austrians, Finns, Bulgarians, and Hungarians. Italians could be Albanians and French, and Japanese, Koreans, and Formosans. Those who'd been naturalized in Australia were usually regarded as having their former nationality. And even for the Australian born, there was confusion and, and ambiguity regarding both nationality and British subjecthood. Although political meetings were forbidden in the camps, as were Nazi and fascist salutes, there were oppor opportunities for irritations to develop into disputes or for deliberate provocation to occur. In camp number three, the family camp in Tatura, a serious incident developed when a local Nazi supporter, Valmada Weber, supported by the Palestinian Germans, provoked a group of refugees. The guards fired shots in the air to quell the unrest. On another occasion, in Love, Love Day 14A, which housed Italians from North Queensland, a more serious incident occurred, resulting in the killing of an anti-fascist anarchist, Francesco Fantin. The subsequent investigation found the perpetrator an acknowledged fascist, guilty of manslaughter rather than murder. The authorities noted that political differences caused the most trouble and concluded that a certain amount of friction was inevitable. The fate of Great Britain's internees from the Danira and the Queen Mary was resolved before that of the other groups of internees. There was no provision for overseas internees to be released in Australia because of the, agree the agreement between Australia and the UK. Um, however, early in 1941, the Home Office sent Major Leighton to, to Australia, who he's been mentioned earlier tonight, 
to conduct a review of the, the cases of those who arrived from England. And he advocated gradual releases of refugees and other internees for return to England to serve in the Pioneer Corps or to migrate to a neutral country. Dr. Paolo Ottolenghi, one of the Italians from Sing Singapore and others were released, released in this way in 1941, as were numbers of the Danira refugees and also a few of the Danira Italians. By early 1942, releases were available to those prepared to enlist in the 8th Labour Company of the Australian Military Forces. The Australian government appointed an Aliens Classification and Advisory Committee to amend the regulations where obvious injustice had been perpetuated. The committee, chaired by the politician Arthur Caldwell, introduced the category of refugee alien and permitted outside employment, which was taken up by many of the refugee aliens who were still in, turn, in internment. By February 1944, only 472 Danira internees were still interned. Once the threat of invasion of Northern Australia passed, some local Italians, including my father, were released towards the end of 1942. And with Italy's capitulation in 1943, Italian releases were more numerous, so that by the end of 1943, most of the local Italians had been released. Local Germans were released more slowly and very few were still in internment when the war ended. Because most of the local, local Japanese had not been eligible to be naturalised because of Australia's racist policies and also because of fears of reprisals for the Japanese mistreatment of Australian prisoners, most Japanese remained in camp after the war and were repatriated to Japan in 1947. In total, there were roughly 8,000 Australian local civilian refugee internees and another 4,530 civilians from Australia's neighbourhood who were interned. In October 1945, there were still 1,129 of the overseas internees in Australia, 684 of them from Palestine, 403 from Milan. Iran and 36 from Malaya. There was no easy solution to the problem of the overseas internees who didn't wish to remain in Australia because they were under the control of the Australian army, but they were responsible of the, of the colonial office to provide their, their return. And returning to their country of internment, whether Palestine, Iran or Malaya, presented many difficulties. Some of the Italians from Malaya who remained in the camp only finally left Australia at the end of December 1946. The Templars from Palestine re-established their community in Melbourne and many of the Iranian Germans also remained. About 900 of the Danira internees settled in Australia after the war and numbers of them made a significant contribution to various aspects of Australian life, including education, music, and the arts and sciences. Another large group still in Australia at the end of the war was the 18,000 Italian prisoners of war who'd been allowed to live and work on farms, living with, with farm families without guards. These farming soldiers, as they were known, were repatriated in 1947, and many of them returned in later years as immigrants to Australia too. In the case, in the case of the local internees, many believed they'd been interned because of their non-British ancestry, and others thought their internment was because they had not taken naturalisation to become British subjects. Consequently, at the end of the war, there was a rush of applications for naturalisation. The wartime internments exposed the ambiguity and the problems the authorities experienced with their designations of nationality in Australia. This confusion had arisen because citizenship, citizenship as a formal category 
did not exist in Australia and Australians were British subjects. It was not until the Australian Nationality and Citizen Act, Citizenship Act of 1948 was implemented on Australia Day 1949 that the category of Australian citizenship came into being and the confusion was resolved. The wartime experience of other cult cultures aided the post-war transformation of Australia from a predominantly British community to one celebrating cultural diversity. This was greatly aided by the introduction of Australian citizenship. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed, Ilma. That was really, really fascinating. I, for one, learned a lot, and I think it very fruitfully further complicates the wider picture in ways that I'm sure we'll discuss later. There's one very specific question, perhaps, before we move on to Alan's talk, if I may, um, from yes. uh, Mary Claire Adam, who many of you will know is the uh, daughter of Leonard Adam, uh, a fascinating character, of course, in his own right. Um, I'd like to ask Ilma whether she has any information about an Italian who came on the Queen Mary and was interned in Tatura. His name was Signore Neri, and my father painted his portraits. I'd love to know more about him. Yes, he was a sculptor, wasn't he? Or was he yeah. a musician? Uh, I, I, now, I've um, the book that was written by, uh, by one of the Italian women mentions him uh, quite a bit. And some of the other Italians from, from there um, have been in touch uh, with, with the, there's a museum in Tatura. And uh, yes, I'll see if I, I'll find some more information about him. But yes, I, he, he's one of the ones who's, who's mentioned uh, in the diary by Ottilia Reginato, uh, <coughs> which was pu published in 2016 by her daughters. The daughters, by the way, were born in Tatura. It was the family camp. And there were about a hundred children, more than a hundred children, born in Tatura, to the into the families of those uh, those internees. Um, yes, so she's meant he's mentioned in the diary, in the in the diary of Ottilia Reginato. Very good. So perhaps the two of you can be in direct contact about that. I think Carol Bunyan. Be Carol yes. Bunyan is yes. actually confirming that he was in fact uh, Mary Claire, a musician. Yes, so just, just he was a musician, right? Yes, there were sculptors and music. I have all their names, but I, I didn't know much more about them than their names being mentioned in the diary. Uh, a question about the Pioneer Corps. Can we just perhaps leave that as a good question and certainly something that should be mentioned? Perhaps let's move on to. Alan's talk, and then in the Q&A, Peter will we'll, uh, address that question. Lovely, so over to Alan, who for the first time will be screen sharing, so perhaps you'd like to set that in motion. His talk again is going to narrow the focus and for the first time actually look in detail at the visual productions of the internment camps. Um, he's called his talk, The Dunera Souvenir Artworks, and that questioning of the term souvenir, Alan, is maybe something we can address afterwards. Uh, anyway, the, the Dunera Souvenir Artworks of Hay Camp, Hay Camps 7 and 8, quite specific, but fascinating. I have no doubt. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Alan Morgenroth. He's a UK-based independent researcher on the internment of enemy aliens by the British in World War II and those deported to Australia in 1940. Um, initially inspired by, once again, a very personal connection to the subject, his research into his own father's experiences as a Junera boy, he spent 14 years delving deeper into all aspects of the internment saga um, and now has an extensive knowledge both of internment in Britain and Australia. And I should also just add and that his first academic book chapter is due to be published quite soon in 2022 in um, an edited collection called British Internment and the Internment of Britons, Second World War Camps, History and Heritage by Bloomsbury Academic, um, co-edited, uh, I think I'm right, by Dr. Rachel Pistol, who happens to be Alan's wife. Okay, over to you, Alan. Thank you. Um, this will be a very quick um, uh, canter through a lot of artworks uh, and I hope um, my talk will keep pace with the slides, uh, which are going to automatically flip. So here we go. <clears throat> uh, my father was a Denier internee and was transferred along with just under 2,000 refugee internees who had been disembarked at Sydney on the 6th of September 1940 and transferred to the Hay internment camp in New South Wales, where they spent the next eight and a half months. This illustrated talk will seek to show 
through the internees, souvenir artworks and banknotes, how the two camps, seven and eight, developed different characters, um, but how despite the adverse conditions of their enforced confinement, the internees in both camps flourished. On their arrival at Hay, the internees were all housed in Camp 8, as the second camp was not finished. Uh, the camps were less than 200 yards apart, and over the next two weeks, as the second camp was completed, the internees chose how the 2,000 men would be divided into two roughly equal cohorts. In the end, two, uh, sorry, 200 kosher Jews and about 230 Kitchener camp refugees with over 500 other internees, many of whom were overtly pro-British and often spoke English rather than German, went to Camp 7. And the remaining number, who were generally rather more left-wing and spoke less English, remained in Camp 8. A draft constitution had been written during the Denira voyage, uh, <clears throat> and both camps followed the structure for their democracies, uh, electing hut representatives from whom members of the camp parliament were elected with separate elections for the camp spoke, spokesman and his deputy. However, two weeks after the arrival, um, communications between the two groups was abruptly prohibited and their respective societies were left to develop in isolation. <clears throat> um, I will start the next bit of the talk by looking at the economies of the um, uh, two camps uh, as illustrated by the banking systems and the banknotes that they um, introduced. Um, and this is a particular uh, pet subject of mine because my father happened to be a member of the MID in Camp 8, which was the money issuing department. So here are the pictures of some of the banknotes that they produced. Um, uh, on the left is rather more sophisticated look of the Camp 7 money, which I've alluded to earlier, the George Telcher notes, and the Camp 8 money, which is uh, rather more crude uh, and hastily prepared um, notes. Uh, <clears throat> Camp 8 rapidly developed an economic structure designed to keep communists from taking control of the camp. This structure sought to make enough profit from camp activities to pay a small wage to all internees who wish to work and pay welfare to those unable to do so. Camp 7 was however different. Initially, they only generated enough money to pay for the jobs in the camp nobody else wished to perform. So toilet cleaners and grease trap cleaners were initially the only ones that got paid. Wait for the slide to flip. All right, that's. Um, I don't can see. You, can you move it on manually, Alan? I don't know. Let, let me try. Um, yes, there we go. Um, so these are some of the um, Camp 8 banknotes. Um, which were hastily prepared and were in operation from as early as October or November 1940. And because there were no materials in the camp, uh, initially um, they were made from potato cuts, um, carvings in potatoes stamped onto toilet paper. And this uh, shows a progression of banknotes which were uh, reissued every month uh, throughout their stay um, and you can see that they become more sophisticated as we go through. So this is one of the early potato cuts, very crude and signed in pencil and numbered in pencil. Uh, and uh, very few of these um, uh, are known to exist. So they're, they're quite a, an unusual one. Here we go, um, CF stands for Community Fund and it's one shilling. And you can see here it's become a little bit more sophisticated. Um, with a um, two-coloured stencil um, and it's now uh, numbered in ink and one of the signatories is in ink and one of the signatories is in crayon. Um, uh, 
here we go um, for January 1941, uh, and the stencil has become more sophisticated, and around the middle, round the one, you might make out that it actually says S-H-I-L-L-I-N-G, so shilling, so that's a one shilling note. Um, it's numbered in crayon and signed in ink. Uh, then um, these two woodcut prints, um, probably from March and April 1941, um, show more sophisticated designs, and these banknotes have been dated. The one on the left is 10th of March 1941, and the one on the uh, right is uh, 31st of March, so it was issued for April. These are the hut notes which were in circulation from the 1st of May 1941 uh, and were the uh, notes in circulation when the camps closed uh, or the denier internees were transferred out of Hay uh, in May 1941. And this shows that they were in fact used as souvenirs because this book of 10 shillings worth of banknotes has been stamped sample without value, uh, was given, uh, one of these books was given to each of the hut leaders as a souvenir to take away. So these had very practical uses, these notes, um, but also had artistic value as well. Now this by contrast is how Camp 7 produced or, their, or worked their money system. So on the left, you've got uh, a worker's card and a credit card. So initially, the camp actually had no currency at all. They had these cards. So if you worked in the camp and the card shows that there's a um, uh, 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 Finkel, Samuel Finkel was paid one shilling a week for work in the camp. Um, and he could then take that to the canteen and spend the money and his balance was duly reduced as he spent his money. If you had uh, money in the bank, um, which had been transferred from England or uh, wherever else, uh, you could draw this money and it was put onto a credit card. So um, here we have um, uh, a credit card for six shillings and sixpence, um, which was used over a period of about three weeks, so at the rate of about two shillings a week. Uh, so for most of their time in existence in the camps, um, there were uh, no currency. However, it was decided um, towards the end of their stay that they should produce some souvenir banknotes, uh, which could be used as money. And George Telcher, uh, who was a Bauhaus artist, uh, was given the um, uh, job of designing um, these uh, banknotes, which were full of hidden meanings um, there were messages in the barbed wire. Um, uh, so here you can see that it says, uh, we are here because we are here because we are here, which was the camp anthem sung to the tune of Old Lang Syne. It had details of HMT to Nera, Liverpool to Hay, um, all uh, discreetly um, hidden within the, uh, within the barbed wire of the design. Uh, here you see the artwork of uh, Emil Wittenberg, which was um, used to promote this um, conference. And you can see that the, uh, uh, his internee number, E40041, um, is the same as his two shilling banknote um, that um, was produced. So they deliberately um, encouraged people with um, uh, to buy the notes from the bank um, to keep as souvenirs. Here you see some more detail of the coat of arms in the middle. Uh, and if you look closely at the sheep um, that's in the middle, uh, it, it contains the word uh, or the name Ep Epstein, Epstein. And Andrew Epstein was the camp leader, the camp spokesman of um, Hay Camp 7. So there you probably can see that. More difficult to see are the names hidden on the back of the um, 25 sheet on the sheep on the back of the notes. Um, and this is great subject to great debate as to who was in there because Telcher never told anybody um, 
whose names he put in there, not even the people who, who was there. So as we found out that Ernst Kitzinger um, and his family had no idea that his name was in the notes. I blow up this one in particular, which is uh, for Werner Goldschmidt, um, because it's very sad to have learnt that this week he died uh, age 99. Um, I now move on to the, um, the different recreation departments and, and entertainment departments in the camps. Um, Camp 7 was the uh, 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 recreation department and the Camp 8 was known as the Music Union. Uh, which again suggests a slightly more left-wing agenda in, in, in Camp 8. Um, uh, in Camp 7, um, Peter Stadlum was one of the famous um, uh, piano, um, concert pianists who, who gave a lot of concerts. Here are some artworks from um, Paul Glass, and you can see that he's painted three different um, programs for the first concert which took place on the 10th of December 1940 um, and I suspect that these were sold as souvenirs at the time uh, and these are other Paul Glass <coughs> um, programs from the time uh, all individually done uh, so um, in Camp 8, um, the uh, programs and tickets were very different. In Camp 8, they actually charged for entry to all the performances. And this was one way that they actually produced more money to pay for wages to pay everybody in the camp rather than just a few. So it was known that only the capitalists in the camp could actually afford to um, go and see some of these performances. Um, but the performance act, performers actually got paid in Camp 8, whereas in Camp 7, um, they weren't paid at all. Uh, and the entertainment department were actually, was actually an expense on the camp funds, whereas in Camp 8, um, the um, performances actually made money for the camp administration. I now move on to the work of Alfred Landauer, um, and he's a, um, a, a rather um, unknown artist from Camp 8, because uh, he, he tended not to sign his works and, and potentially put them as AL. But here you can see an artwork of his for one of the musical concerts um, and one of the tickets for the um, uh, uh, recital by uh, Cholmecki and Lecure. He also produced um, souvenir prints which were commissioned by the um, Camp Parliament. Um, so these are the football print which was given to all sportsmen and was um, uh, given as, as prizes for those who won the league. And on the right is the famous um, IXL um, camp print which was given to all Camp 8 uh, internees when they left the camp in May as a souvenir. And they often got these signed by their um, friends that they'd made within the camp, because as the camps became dispersed, uh, very often they would not see their friends again if they went in different directions, some going back to the UK, some saying in Australia. And when they went to Tura, they were split between several different camps or went to Orange. So there's some debate on, on this print um, as to what the meaning of the, um, uh, the tin with IXL on it with a plant growing out of it means. Um, I maintain um, that this was a deliberate um, um, design of, of Alfred Landauer um, uh, because although those in Australia will know IXL as being a brand of Australian jam um, and Henry Jones, the owner of the company, his motto was I excel in everything I do. Um, 
I believe that the flower in the in the, in the can uh, is an allegory of the internees um, struggling against their adverse conditions um, on the edge of the desert, um, and in the end, um, they excelled in everything that they did in the camp, and and so making a very fitting tribute um, to the internees and the success they had of their time in the camp. Um, so, um, I will now come on um, to um, some of the work of uh, Ludwig Hirschfeld Mack and the uh, woodcuts that he produced within um, Camp 8, and I'll fe feature particularly um, the two woodcuts that he did of swimming on the Murrumbidgee River. Uh, he did two artworks. The one on the left uh, looks like um, more of a trial because it, it's much less sophisticated than the, the second one on the right, uh, a much more detail. Um, and these um, uh, formed part of a series of, of um, prints that he did uh, which appeared, to my view, to be trials of the woodcutting technique um, which he was using and Alfred Landau was also using in the camp. Uh, interestingly, the woodcut technique was not used in Camp 7. And it wasn't until they got to Tatura that uh, other artists seemed to take up this, um, this medium. Um, and the next slide you will see <clears throat> that uh, these are, on the left, are some trials that uh, Hirschfeld Mack produced, uh, which seems to be him trying out the, um, uh, the various engraving tools and the techniques of colouring. And you can see that um, the souvenir prints, which are found in, in various um, diaries and collections of internees um, were produced both in black ink on blue and brown ink on, on, a, on an off-white. And also the second one um, was produced in, in recto and verso forms, um, which again, to my mind, shows that Herschel Mack was very much experimenting with the various techniques of um, producing these artworks. So um, uh, the next artist is a Camp 7 artist that I'm featuring, which is, um, who is Fritz uh, Lowenstein. Um, and he became um, part of the Fleur Furniture Partnership with Ernst Roddick. And uh, he was renowned for making lots of cartoons uh, of the Denira voyage. Uh, now these weren't made on the Denira, he, these were probably made while he was at Hay and Tatura. Uh, and he sold these uh, in sets to um, fellow internees to keep as souvenirs. Um, and again, it, it's uh, uh, one of the many artworks that, that I know was used within the camps uh, as souvenirs rather than art for art's sake. Um, uh, his equivalent, if you like, in Camp 8 was the artist uh, Fred Schonbach, or Fritz Schonbach, um, who produced a lot of um, uh, watercolour sketches of um, camp life. So this one, of people watching a football game and going about their daily life um, in the camp um, is a... Uh, uh, a picture that he produced many times and uh, he was in the same hut as my father in Camp 8 and within my father's collection the the print on the right is is one of the uh, artworks that my father came home with as a souvenir. Um, so um, uh, here also is a rather amusing cartoon um, which again demonstrates how well they performed um, during their time in internment, um, with the top part of the cartoon showing that um, the 
uh, uh, it, it was 2,000 inquiries for one official uh, and the other one saying uh, uh, 20 officials for one inquiry. And I end with um, the pictures of the souvenirs that my father came home with, so the Camp 8 print, uh, the, the money that he had souvenired, um, and the Camp 8 print. So that's a very, very quick canter through um, uh, some of the artworks and, and life within both Camp 7 and 8 at Hay. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. That was absolutely fascinating too, in a very different way to the preceding talks, but very valuable. Um, lovely, do you want to stop screen sharing perhaps? Uh, thank you. Uh, we're running slightly late, but only slightly late, which is a minor miracle where <laughs> conferences are concerned, in my experience. So we do have some time for questions, and I notice already one quite specific one, if I could sum summon it up, and do, do now start typing your questions in if you have them. Uh, yes, from Ian Hengus, who's going to be talking to us um, later for, for Alan. Uh, why was communication between Camp 7 and 8 prohibited? Was it to do with the physical layout of the camps? And if so, surely representatives would have kept in touch. Um, it's, it's a rather strange phenomena. Um, the original instructions for the building of the camps, um, the instructions uh, were given that the camps should be at least one mile apart. Um, now, obviously, those on the ground in Hay, when they actually looked at suitable sites, decided that it would be rather more convenient for the two camps to be close to each other with the camp garrison in between. Um, now, that was actually contrary to the orders that they had been given. Um, so initially, um, they were told to divide the camps uh, or, or, you know, keep, um, uh, stop the communications. And in fact, within a couple of months, there was actually um, quite a tall corrugated iron um, barrier put up between the camps so they couldn't actually communicate with, with each other at all. Um, uh, most of these camps were designed so that they could be used as POW camps and internment camps. And obviously they had no real idea of the, you know, they were initially expecting dangerous aliens to be sent from Britain rather than refugees. Um, so it's one of these strange phenomena that um, they never really caught up with the reality um, and I've only come across one instance when um, people from the camp said that on outside expeditions, which were relatively few and far between, you know, the swimming in the Murrumbidgee was one of the times they went outside the camp, um, that they actually met people from the other camp. So it, it, it was a feature that, um, you know, they would have had various people, um, like some of the religious leaders that came in and people who inspected the camps and other people who visited both camps. So they would have heard tales of what was going on, um, but direct contact, no. Um, my father, I know, was one of the lucky ones. He worked in um, the supply depot at the drill hall in Hay. Uh, and as far as I'm aware, all the people who worked um, alongside him um, were from Camp 8. So again, there was no communication um, between them. And that's how life in the two camps progressed slightly differently. And when you read the diaries of when they were moving to Tatura and they were finally meeting up with each other uh, when they were moving out on the last couple of days into the various groups, um, there was great um, rivalry between them as to which camp they thought had performed best. Um, and and um, and strangely enough, um, these two groups found it very difficult to mix from then on. Um, there was always a lot of rivalry as to who they were electing leaders and and the way they would do things. So it, it's quite an interesting um, aspect of of the life that that there were lots of different groups, whether they be religious groups, political groups. Um, obviously, the political groups just because of the very nature of political people, wanted to have more influence than um, the, the, the general uh, population. Um, 
and and this this aspect of the communists trying to take over Camp Eight um, is uh, not well documented, but there are references to it on numerous occasions. Um, and they didn't succeed because they were a small minority, but they had actually been organised um, from the time. Uh, in England because they were all members of the Communist Party and very often they knew each other before anybody else did. Mm -hmm. Thanks Alan. Um, another specific question um, from Mary Claire Adam again and um, does Alan know whether Peter Stadlin and other musicians did perform in both camps? No because uh, no, uh, he no. had no, no opportunity yeah, yeah. to go from one to the other. Um, obviously Peter Stadlin then went to um, to Tura Camp 2 um, and it, um, the, the, the differences between the two Tatura two camps isn't well known, but so um, uh, Mary Claire's uh, father was in, in Tatura camps three and four, so probably would never have come across Peter Stadlin. Uh, and Peter Stadlin was one of the um, uh, um, camp seven performers uh, and in a recent talk, his son was complaining that his father said that he was never paid for, for his performances because it was too, too pleasant a job. <laughs> okay. um, there's a question from um, Peter Arnott, um, who's also the gentleman who asked the question about the Pioneer Corps, um, about, well, in fact, I think this is one for you, Ilma, although Shimas has um, begun to answer it in uh, typed form, but um, yes, Peter's asking, were both camps mainly filled with Jews from Germany and Austria, and were there any Nazis in these camps? So Ilma, would you like to expand on that? Na Nazis, um, no, because, well. Actually, sorry, Alan, um, I think a question, uh, this is probably for Ilma. Yes? I don't uh, or, or, know, um, I, I, no. Just to, share, just to share the response. I think the Pioneer Corps was mainly uh, set up to accommodate uh, the returning Dunera people. So uh, I wouldn't think there'd be any Nazis in them. Alan, in do you want to do that? In, well, in that um, group, but um, it, you might disagree. <laughs> um, the, the 2000 internees that went direct to Hay rather than to Tura um, uh, were uh, pretty well all B and C category internees from the UK. Um, and amongst their number, I'm only aware of one eventually who decided that he was going to, when he moved to Tatura, uh, to uh, volunteer to be moved to Camp Tatura Camp One um, to be with the uh, pro-Nazi supporters rather than the refugees. Yes, well, that he was been, the he had, been, he had been a merchant seaman um, mm -hmm. in in the UK. And, and wasn't really a refugee. Um, the those yeah, that didn't were... go to Hay, um, the the ones that went to Tura, um, were had the two hundred Italians who went to um, uh, the Italian camp at Tura, um, and then there was a very mixed bunch of two hundred and fifty category A survivors of the Arandora Star, plus ninety five. Um, selected people who, for one reason or another, uh, might have been considered slightly more suspect. They were mainly Category B, um, and Mary Claire's father was one of those. Um, some of those were pro-Nazi and some of them were anti-Nazi, and they soon got split. So um, ones like Mary Claire's father, uh, along with the anti-Nazis, went um, uh, into Camp 3, and the Nazi supporters and the merchant seamen, of whom there were quite a few, um, went initially to Tatura 1 and were eventually transferred to POW camps, um, either the Durringal um, officers camp uh, or Murchison um, camp 13. Yeah, that, that, that's probably so. Um, yeah, I, I don't know terribly much about uh, the Danira people, um, but some of the Italians went back as well as the, um, the, the ones who were all Germans. Yeah. So. Thank you. Um, fine. 
questions and indeed responses to the questions coming in thick and fast. We've got an almost parallel conversation going on, which is slightly distracting, but that, that, that's fair enough. Um, fine, Peter again is anxious to know about the Pioneer Corps, which is somewhat outside our remit, but Peter, perhaps I'm not an expert on this, but essentially, by my understanding, and I think maybe Ra Rachel Pistol, who's intervened in the <coughs> chat, will have more to say, but essentially it was a, um, a civilian quasi-military unit. It wasn't an active combat unit, but no, it, no, no. <coughs> it was the way in which, um, <coughs> sorry, the internees could actually find a fast way out of internment, certainly from the Isle of Man, uh, primarily, yeah, and it was one that many of them for obvious reasons took because it was their way of beginning to fight against the Nazis, yeah? Um, but it was a non-competent yeah. uh, unit made up mostly, I think I'm right, of former refugees turned internees. And the Isle of Man is a whole related but other story, Peter, and you, I don't think we have time to talk about it in um, detail here, but essentially when people in the UK, the, the ref, mostly refugees, <coughs> were interned in mainland UK, most of them ended up on the Isle of Man, but from Heighton, which was near Liverpool, many of them actually were deported not to the Isle of Man, but in fact either to Canada, yeah, or to Australia on the infamous Dunera. Um, so the Isle of Man in terms of the UK based story is of pivotal importance. And if you're interested, if you look at the Insiders Outsiders YouTube channel um, and indeed at the What's On section of the website, you'll see a whole host of different talks that are specifically about the Isle of Man for anybody else who's interested as well. Um, did they fight as soldiers? No, no, I think it was a non-competent. I'm right, Rachel, aren't I? That it was a non-competent unit. Okay, and just- one with more... the Sorry, go on. Am I gone? I was saying it's the same with the the Australian Eighth uh, thing. They 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 were part of the Australian Army, but they were they were didn't ever go into combat. They they were doing civilian type work. I think yes. in due course that, that that's not um, the members of the Pioneer Corps were given the opportunity some while later. I'm not later, sure the exact exactly. date, mm -hmm. and they mm. uh, many of them did go into. Um, the uh, active fighting battalions uh, and many into the X Corps, uh, which were the um, uh, the the SAS of mm. uh, of the Second World War. Um, so yes, uh, Rachel saying it's 1943. Mm. 43. So quite mm. quite a lot later, and that's a whole other fascinating story. And in fact, Insiders Outsiders has been working or has in the pipeline a whole series of talks precisely about the often quite surprising and dangerous, courageous ways in which the former refugees indeed contributed to the Allied war effort. So you might like to look out for that. Um, we are. I think in need of a break, but I've just got one very personal comment from Diana da Costa, which will be of interest, I think. My father was in charge of supplies in Camp 7. Alan, this is for you. Would he have been allowed out to the depot? Um, I think the answer to that is probably no, because he was from Camp 7. Um, and for the reasons of the separation, I th think it was just a very small number uh, from Camp 8 uh, who were allowed out to the depot. Um, there were relatively few opportunities to leave the camp. There were a few working parties that left the camp, but in their time at Hay, um, it was before the Australian authorities paid for any work um, that was done by internees. That happened when they were in Tatura. So the wages that they uh, were paid had to be produced um, through the um, self-financing economics of the camps themselves within Hay. Um, there were a few working parties that, that went out, I think, more on a voluntary basis than anything else. Um, so... Yes, they always volunteer to be sent outside. They, from all the internment camps, as I know, they, were, they had to volunteer and they were paid a shilling a day. <laughs> this was particularly, um, my knowledge mainly relates to Love Day in South Australia, but... I think it was fairly standard across the other camps too. So on much longer, Ilma. I think probably we ought to. Oh, no, no, no. I mean, there is clearly a huge amount more to be said. And actually, Carol Bonian has quite rightly corrected me in that, as I should have actually <coughs> been aware, I am aware, <coughs> quite a few of the people who ended up on the Dunera were indeed on the Isle of Man. They were promised, you know, an easier option, if you like, completely, you know, an act of deceitfulness on the part of the British, which is something else we can perhaps talk about later. <laughs> Very good. I think a, a break is needed and we're running slightly late, but shall we say a 10 minute break now, just 
Yep. Okay, so mention has um, already been made of a Bauhaus connection in the form of George Telcher's wonderful, uh, <clears throat> much more complicated than they seem on the surface, banknotes. Mm -hmm. And we're now going to hand over to Andrew McNamara, who is, as far as I can see, very much the expert on the Bauhaus connection in Australia. He's the professor of art history at Queensland no. <laughs> University of um, Technology, the QUT. Uh, his recent publications, I'll just run through these very quickly, yeah, include yeah, yeah. Undesign, yeah, yeah. Um, Surpassing Modernity, Ambivalence in Art, Politics and Society, and um, most yeah. relevant <coughs> to us today, can everybody make sure they're muted please, um, Bauhaus, Diaspora and Beyond, Transforming Education Through Art, Design and Architecture, and also relevantly he curated Bauhaus now at the Museum of Brisbane um, earlier this year. So over over to um, Andrew, and I believe Seamus, are you going to be dealing with the PowerPoints? I'll leave it to the two of you to, to sort that one out. But clearly we've got we've got the PowerPoint already on screen. Up yeah, I'm having over difficulties here. loading mine. So I was just wondering if it's possible um, to get access. Well, um, here it is. So I wouldn't worry too much. I think if you just indicate to Seamus when you want the images to move on, that should be fine. Yeah. Okay, how do you want me to indicate the next slide? Something like that, Shane? Yes, absolutely, as you would in, in real life. It, it, sure, it's, sure. it's going to be a bit like Alan's, it's a bit of a, a run through. Sorry, I've never had problems with Zoom before, so it's peculiar. Well, worry that not. It's... Worry not. Um, okay, so this project, it wasn't really a De Niro project, uh, and I'll go to the next slide uh, just to give context. The I was involved in a project with Anne Stephen and Philip Goh, the architectural historian, and we were looking <coughs> for a book for the centenary of the Bauhaus to explore. The idea of the, uh, the centenary was to explore where the Bauhaus legacy went to and perhaps why it was so pervasive. So this, our project was to trace how it uh, ended up in Australia and New Zealand. So along the way, we did intersect with two other projects that have already been mentioned, Seamus's one. I first met Seamus through doing this project, and then we, I also did this exhibition where we had the pleasure of launching um, Resi and Chris's biography of Herschel Mack. I do want to um, see here, this is the exhibition I've curated Bauhaus now at the Museum of Brisbane, which was more a Nan Stephen curated one in Melbourne. So that's the context we're looking at the Bauhaus project, so it intersects with the De Niro story, and I found actually both Resi and Seamus, I should make a quick point to say, they're both very generous <laughs> colleagues, and so they were very helpful along the way in our project, which just seemed to be spidering across too many different other projects. So basically, my if we'll just skip, you don't need the abstract so much, Seamus, it's just to say that um, it's really the educational Legacy. So it emerged from the Bauhaus project. I'll keep moving. One more, um, Seamus. One of the things we were interested in exploring was uh, there's no real Bauhaus school, there's no Bauhaus college, no uh, so no institution. So it comes through diffuse figures, but what we were tracing was the educational um, component. So within that, we found there was a, a shared ide ideology that through the figures we're looking at in Australia, looking at this um, approach that's very interdisciplinary that comes from the Bauhaus, looking at the nature of materials and breaking them down to component parts and then rebuilding um, those component parts again. And this was one of the things we found in all the figures I'll um, show in the rest of this lecture. Next one, Seamus, thanks. So one of those key points that um, we were, um, it was a historical awesome. accident, if you like, in 1923, the Bauhaus um, was in, facing a lot of pressure in um, in Weimar to, and Gropius was being asked to show what was actually happening in the institution. And there was a week long exhibition, the famous 23 Bauhaus exhibition. And two students at the time, or in Herschel and Max's case, some, somewhat um, teaching, some, but still uh, uh, sort of a teacher, uh, sorry, stu student, at least not a master, two that um, came to meet each other again in Australia were the next one, 
Seamus, two figures we've already talked about, Telchler and um, Hirschfeld Mack. So Telchler uh, and Hirschfeld Mack both did posters for the Bauhaus Week exhibition. You can see uh, uh, Telchler's one here. He was working very closely at the time with Oscar Schlemmer and in the, uh, the Bauhaus Buna, the stage, which they saw as one of the key components of this interdisciplinary bringing things together. And you have this bouncing figure who's meant to represent theatre as one of the key aspects of Bauhaus productivity. So during this week, both Telchler and Hirschfeld Mack had two significant works that even though they weren't the famous masters of the Bauhaus, they had um, significant and popular works. So next one, Seamus. In Telchler's case, he worked with Kurt Schmidt to do this mechanical ballet. And it wasn't shown at the Bauhaus, the stuff was shown nearby, but it was an important, um, uh, it was a dance. It's an important crossover, if you like, between different fields. So it's theatre, dance, uh, design, and it had a very strong colour components. So if you go to the next one, Seamus, you can see this was recreated in uh, Dusseldorf to show the colour components of this. And it's a battle between the colour figures and the black and white figure. And one more, Seamus, we were lucky. We had students who were from various different disciplines that came together to create this in the exhibition I curated, Bauhaus Now. Um, we have time later on. I could show you a little snippet of it, but we'll just keep going. Thanks, Seamus. And Hirschfeld Mack, his most famous work from that, also from that show, was these um, colour light plays, the Faber Nischbiller. Um, go quick, this is a catalogue for it. And keep going, um, Seamus. And these are the sorts of projections that you see from the machine. And keep going further, and you see Hirschfeld Mack working on this and was working on it for quite a while. And so, it was fascinating that both Telchler and Hirschfeld Mack, um, the last time they probably seen each other was in the Weimar Bauhaus until they were both interned. And they both had this common shared history and that they both um, had out of the blue, these two most talked about and most um, popular works from the Bauhaus 23 exhibition. In many cases, you read the reports at the time and both these works stole the show. Hirschfeld Mack did other works at the time. Next one, Seamus. Most important work, why I say he was a transitional figure because he was asked to um, teach the colour seminar and he produced these toys that are still um, sold today. The next one's a bit better definition. I actually had one of these myself, the optical toys, the spinning tops that show how colour mixes together. One of the most popular Bauhaus toys and it overlaps with Hirschfeld Mack's um, focus on colour. He had studied um, Herzl in Stuttgart, so he was um, in a good position to take over after Eaton was sacked at the Bauhaus. Okay, keep going, thanks. After Bauhaus moves to Dessau, Hirschfeld Mack moved into, well, he was also trying to um, develop his um, Faber Nischbiller machine, the Color of Light plays, and went on exhibition tour with them. And he also gradually moved into art education. I won't say too much because I know Chris and Rizzi will, I actually, I don't know what they're going to say, but I will try not to do too much what they're going to do. Okay, next one. And you see this occurs all the time in England when he, what happens is all the schools he uh, is working at, Vickersdorf, uh, Frankfurt under order, Kiel all get closed down, he moves to England in a variety of different works. And the other thing that he does here is a colour music um, affinity, colour music chords where children are learnt to um, learn music through colour rather than musical notation. Okay, next one, Seamus. And you can see at the time that um, there was... Um, sorry, my daughter's just come home from work. Sorry, this is live, live, live. Uh, it's about, I have to say, it's nine o'clock here at night and I've battled through. There was a storm here and it was really noisy. So I'm going through all the various parts of the elements. Um, 
so the next time they meet, of course, is in the Denera. We've gone into that story quite a bit, so I'll just quickly move on from there. Um, the, one of the more famous works of um, refugee work in general, from um, in term, his uh, Hirschfeld Max famous internment camp image, keep going, Seamus. And we've already seen Telchler's contribution. This is a, uh, probably the the work that Telchler's most famous for for his period in Australia, the the um, the banknotes, which are incredibly well crafted. But of course, quite humorous. We show the next one, Seamus. Um, there, just to add some other bits to what, oh, to just go back one. Um, there's some inter interesting aspects to uh, the, the material that Seamus have come across, particularly in Telchler's collection. Um, one of the things he was asked by his wife what he most remembers about hay and he said that it was always the chairs because they'd go for a break and they'd come back to a room for an, a lecture and there'd be no chairs and they'd have to go off to some other place and get the chairs and the other thing he said if we go walk just one more Seamus asked about why all the sheep on the back and he said well when we got to Australia the diet was lamp 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 so he just wanted to throw that little aspect into. Um, next, Seamus. Uh, just a quick thing to show the whole Hirschfeld McInturney record. Um, all the other specialists here will have known these, but it's interesting when you're a researcher, you're doing this sort of thing, you find out what documentation, how important documents are, and you come across them so often um, from various different figures. And um, I just thought this was quite interesting. And interesting because um, Hirschfeld Mack also went to all the camps, um, Hay, Orange, and Tatura, and probably spent quite a long time in internment. Uh, next, Seamus, and the record of his permanent residence in January 45. Um, next, please. Another figure um, who's also directly from the Bauhaus is Gertrude Hertzger who um, named Seligman. She was, um, she's also studied the Bauhaus and is clearly not as well known as um, Tolchler or um, Hirschfeld Mack. She studied under Eaton, as you can see here. And um, then she was also a musician. She played um, the violin in Sydney and went to soirees with the Sidlers. And she's also, also, like Hirschfeld Mack, had a connection with Clay. Hirschfeld Mack worked next door to Clay and did a lot of experimental prints with him. And um, Hertzger um, remembers playing violin and playing music with um, Clay. Okay, I'll just show some works quickly what she did. Some works from the Bauhaus, to, you know, sort of color designs you see here, color study. This is her business card. She's more of a designer when working in Sydney. Um, one more. Um, Hirschfeld Mack's uh, internment poster has a constellation of the Southern Cross, and you see it here that's been reworked in um, Gertrude Hertzger's uh, brooch from approximately 1960 here. Um, next one, Seamus. And just to show some of the other sorts of uh, range of design she, work she does. She does textile works here and a carpet design on the right, come back to 37. And finally, shame is just one more furniture design that she um, created. Okay, so from there, um, material studies gets taken up and renewed. Material studies important part of the Bauhaus course, revised in Australia when Hirschfeld Mack uh, finally uh, gets to work at uh, Geelong Grammar. And uh, Geelong Grammar is a very rarefied um, atmosphere. So the importance of Hirschfeld Mack is that he eventually gets to uh, become an advisor on a curriculum in uh, Victoria and develops the uh, material studies um, curriculum more widely. And you see these students here working with um, basic material here to create um, sculptural elements. Uh, next one. 
And a key, also a key figure, uh, Gerhard Herbst, who is well known in Australia as a designer. He becomes very important at RMIT and he um, works with uh, a company called Prestor for a while before the, um, around the war and after the war. And he's very important for bringing this sort of Bauhaus ethos. Um, if we go one more, Seamus, see him here working for Presto and keep going, Seamus, one more. Um, some, this in this case, a, a very later work, but students doing material studies. And in this one, they're asked to perform design. And the last one, Seamus, um, some examples of student work from RMIT in the mid 60s, where they continue this exploration of different materials uh, from material study exercises. So it's a very good example of how a, a Bauhaus ethos um, does become very important in one institution, in this case, RMIT. I just want to finish then show two examples of people who are probably not so well known in our project. We also looked at this Bauhaus ethos, um, not just interdisciplinary, that people still keep coming after the war. Our earliest figure is Eleanor Langer from um, Frankfurt in 1930, but I'll just use two post-war examples to finish off. Uh, Stanislaw Stoyakovsky, he ends up in Germany during the war on a forced labor program, and um, he ends up in Dusseldorf, so he's in the American sector, and he studies in Dusseldorf at the famous academy there. And when he comes to Australia, he gets design work working with Prestige and with uh, Gerhard Herbst. So I think um, Jay was talking earlier on who helps these people. Well, there is a sort of a, a small group of designers who are all helping each other, uh, particularly from this emigre network. Okay, next one, Janice, thanks. But the design work doesn't last long and Astoria Kukowski has this moment where he goes um, doing mining work in um, more remote outback Australia. And um, he has this epiphany at that stage, he says, and he decides he's not gonna be a painter or sculptor or anything else. He's just becoming an artist of light. And you see a later image of him where he has um, projections of color uh, light upon himself. Could we so I'll quickly go through for a few examples? Here's one for the Adelaide Festival where he took over a building and made it into almost this Gerhard Richter esque color charts where each window had a color designated to it and had this overall effect. But during the Adelaide Festival, there was this um, eruption in Indonesia which created um, an atmospheric. Uh, this magenta atmospheric effect in Adelaide as a, as a side effect. And um, so that enabled Storytokovsky to declare all of Adelaide as sort of like a ready-made as all part of his own work. So it surrounded this um, uh, building. And so next one, Seamus, you can see this had such notoriety, it was even picked up in the Australian Women's Weekly in April 1964, where they did a, a highlight to show that the magenta sky with um, Astoria Kukowski's creation. Oh, oh, next one. Um, he moves into, because he's, uh, he says he's an artist of light, he doesn't particularly worry about whether it's painting or not, but he moves uh, very early into electronic art. Here's one he does for the ma magazine Mianjin. All these little um, sections open up. Uh, it's uh, and you see other type of light bulbs in that stage. So he was working, uh, doing experimental work with companies like Philips and uh, eventually um, computer companies as well. Uh, next one. You can see one of his computers where he's generating this sort of uh, laser sound explorations, 1972. Next one, please. Next one, yeah. um, he, he goes to California and does, just one back, sorry. Yeah, he does, he's one of his last um, works to start to develop, well, looking at things like alpha waves. So he does this report, working on the possibilities of use of alpha waves, the human brain, the fields of art, 73. What he was trying to work on was to have no medium whatsoever by the end to try and to somehow figure out how humans can generate light color projections straight from the brain. So um, it's a sort of area he was looking into. Um, and next one, Shame is just to show the sorts of 
um, it, it, it's almost like an electronic or computerized version of the return to the Gesamtkunstwerk, this I, whole idea of this creating, or, um, like this, the Bauhaus stage, to bring all the arts together. Here we have musical performances. These are sort of an example of the types of performances um, Astori Kokovsky was interested in. And my last figure, I'm going, how am I going for time, okay? Um, Udo Selbeck, who comes to Australia, he, he, similarly to um, Astoria Kokovsky, he is trained in Germany after the war and he becomes an important printmaker. He trains, uh, sorry, he trains in Cologne in a sort of Bauhaus style um, environment and then um, comes to teach in Adelaide, first of all, Tasmania. QCA in Brisbane, and then founds the Canberra School of Arts on a Bauhaus workshop model. So he's primarily a printer. Keep going, Seamus. Uh, his later works, or, or, when he comes to Australia, he begins to explore these landscapes, which are semi-abstracted, but um, they are memories of a very particular memory of his life. Go to the next one, Seamus. It becomes more clear what he's on about. Um, Selbach was taken out of school at the dying ages, uh, dying phase of World War II and sent to the Eastern Front where he was, um, uh, you know, a, a, a very young child, um, a, a youth soldier, was barely trained and sent off to fight the Russians and, of course, was very soon captured. And he was about to be executed and he, he was just very lucky. They went to have um, morning tea and he managed to escape. And he ended up walking all the way from the Eastern Front back to Cologne. By the time he got to Cologne, it was a complete ruin. So these landscapes, he begins to explore this journey back on this way. So you see these landscapes are seen quite abstracted, but they could be full of machinery, bones, metal, etc. So it's about these landscapes that, put to, um, that occur in his memory. Uh, next one, Seamus. You see another example of these. Um, Bernard Smith at one stage, Australian art story, calls them the, the most strongest, powerful um, and grim work ever seen in white Western uh, Australian art. And the last one, um, by the late 60s, uh, a lot of people thought his works were going, moved from sort of this semi-abstract realist uh, printmaking to this abstraction. And they were shown a big exhibition of abstraction called the Field Exhibition, and then he showed works like this. But they are also fields, that they're, they're sort of abstract, but they're also representational. They, he talks about them as being almost seeing from a bird's eye view and looking down upon charred fields. And you can see this wreckage and tornness around the periphery of the image. So it is another way of exploring this sort of landscape. And he tends to spend most of his time in Australia exploring this great moment. And then it becomes um, something that he begins to reflect on on contemporary events too, like the Vietnam War and other contemporary events in Australia. Okay, that's it for me. Thank you. It's a quick rush through, but thanks very much for your technical help there, Seamus. And, and thank you very much, Andrew, again, absolutely fascinating. Um, I think we should probably proceed without any break. Well, yes, and that was always the plan to the presentation about uh, Ludwig um, Hirschfeld Mack. And uh, Chris and Rosie, perhaps you'll forgive me if I don't give a long introduction uh, to you, but simply say that you are most importantly for our purposes, the co-authors of a recent excellent new publication that's been alluded to several times called, I think significantly, Ludwig Hirschfeld Mack, more than a Bauhaus artist, because clearly the Bauhaus side of things is not the whole story. So I'm not quite sure exactly how you're going to do this, and I can't actually see you on screen. Resi, you're going to set the ball rolling first. I, I am this. on screen now, so Lovely. I, I, was, so I had muted myself. Fire, fire ahead. Okay, I'm going to start now. I've got to find this. Um, just let me share this and start slideshow and start from the big 
I'm going to do the slide chart and stuff. And then, well, I'm going to be talking about um, Ludwig Hirschfeldmack now. Um, and I decided because it's got an English connection, I thought I'd talk about some of his time in England, which is not really that well known. Okay, so I'll just talk a bit a bit about it. Uh, the, I first came across Ludwig Hirschfeldmack when I saw this um, this woodcut that he did of Tatura. And of course, it brought back memories because I was one of the people who was born in Tatura. My parents had come from, from Palestine, as, as mentioned before. And so this, this sort of started the interest. And then, so I started collecting material. I was still working full time as a German teacher at the time. So then I started collecting material and I was fortunate enough to go and meet this is Amaga, the, 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 the lady, the lovely lady with the white hair is Chris's mother, Chris Bell. We've just, as I said, we've just written the, the book together. And um, through, Ma through Margo, I started to meet members of the Hirschfeld family who, who kindly gave me a lot of material. And we've got two members here. We've got Renate. It's lovely to have you along. She's the... Um, the granddaughter of Hirschfeld Mack's sister, Emmy. So, so th they all helped me get the, the stuff together. So this is where it, the journey began. Okay, so now uh, uh, Andrew's just mentioned about the, the bowl. He's probably most famous for these colour light plays, which he produced while he was in, in, um, in at the Weimar Bowl House. And the interesting thing, he got these beautiful effects by using different types of lamps and, and they would have layers. And as you can see, you can see a dark red and then it becomes lighter and lighter and you use that with the lamp. And it was so, and he even wrote his own music to go with it. And so it was really an art display, a moving art display. And, I, and as I said, I first came across it when I visited the exhibition and I was really fascinated with it. So now we'll go, we'll go to his life. Now, as uh, what's his name explained, Andrew explained, he, he, the Bauhaus closed down, he started teaching, he te taught in, in um, uh, Frankfurt under order and in, in Kiel, but then with the rise of the Nazis, that was finished and then he went to Berlin in 1933 and tried to make a living making musical instruments that lasted for a while but then after the Nuremberg rallies it turned out he he was classified as a um a Mischling Ersten Grades so that meant he was um with his Jewish heritage he although he was brought up as a Christian it didn't matter he had the the Jewish heritage and which meant that he couldn't really work he couldn't get any work which forced him to leave his family and start to look for work elsewhere and through his um, father-in-law he had some Quaker connections and with the Clark family and then he got work at uh, now I hope I'm saying this right Carnarvon in Wales, which is near Pontypool. And this is, and this was a Quaker subsistence program. And the the um, building you see in the middle there is the old brewery. But uh, I think that was turned into a, to a, a workshop where they taught the miners some skills mm. because th they were now unemployed and they needed some skills. And so he was in charge of the um, woodwork department, the carpentry shop. So before he started that, he returned to Germany, spent two weeks as a carpenter to, to, you know, to get his skills ready. And then he started, he worked here and this, this is, so this is a sketch he did of where he lived in Wales and where he worked in Wales. And he was also in charge of the work camps. This was part of the uh, Quaker program. And you can see some of the things that he was in charge with. Here they are. They started building um, an open air theatre, which he designed. And you can see, and anybody who, who I don't know who's been there, I'd love to know if this theatre is still there or, if, or it's been ruined, but been uh, 
knocked down or not, but that was the theatre that he designed, an open air amphitheatre in, in Carnarvon in, in Wales. As well as that, he taught uh, the, the miners to make uh, usual furniture to make um, uh, you know, chairs. He had designed chairs before that and they made Christmas presents, but he also taught um, musical instrument making to, to the, the children in the district. They made bamboo pipes and, and things like that. So he was really good at, at um, he, ha he actually had designed um, a, a book on instrument making, which was supposed to go with the Karl, Karl Orff um, Schulwerk, right? So he was really good at this sort of thing. So that's, um, that's the part of his there. Um, I'll go on. Um, but he did do some paintings, a few. Of the, uh, there's not that many left, apparently. Some of them were lost. So this is one of the paintings he did of a, of a girl in Wales with the sheep. And then, if I've gone, gone too far, I've gone too far. I've got to go back. Excuse me while I try to go back. Oh, oh, right on. Yeah, we're there. Okay. Well, then <coughs> he, after spending Christmas in Germany, he, he, when this uh, Quaker uh, subsistence program ran out of money, he, he, in 1938, he returned again, went home for, for, for Christmas, then came back and started to look for some new work. And he found some work with the um, Peckham Health Centre. I don't know if people are, are familiar with that. But, um, and there he was worked with um, students and he started making instruments, musical instruments. But then what he found was as soon as they made the instruments, they got bored. So he designed this, this, it, this it was called a color chord and which meant that the, and I'll show you how it goes. And it, this is an article from the from the um, newspaper of the time when Queen Mary actually paid, played this uh, instrument. And he was known actually, you can see it was called Mr. Mac because he decided to use his, his, um, his mother's maiden name, which is pronounced Mac in German, but it, it did well with the, with the Scottish Mac. So this is, this is uh, the newspaper article uh, explaining when she visited, when Queen Mary visited. And what this color chord consisted of, he would be playing a tune and then he would pop up a color. There's his pedals there and he would pop up a color, a blue. And then the, the students would actually turn to the color. So you can see this color chord has, has colors on the top. And so the students would go on and play that particular chord. But the thing was, he felt that in time, the students actually didn't even have to look at, the, at this color indicator because they, their ears became attuned and they knew which chords to play. So it was part of also uh, teaching them to, to think about, uh, about music and become, you know, learn what to about it. And this is him. He always had his, his um, he was very musical and, and uh, he had, um, that you can see him playing his harmonica or his accordion, right? So there. Then, then, well, he he had he only had part time work when he returned to England. It did not like like at Wales where he was permanently <coughs> employed. So he he had to scratch some money together. So again, he he had uh, taught musical instrument making in in Germany already. So these are some. Of, so he held classes at Abbott's Toys. Again, I think they were a Quaker connection. And so he made for children at this age, for under three to five, I can enlarge it a bit and you can see it from, from eight to 10. So they all made different little instruments. And as I said, the instruments got more, more complex as, um, as they got older. So this is one of the brochures from Abbott's Toys, hand, handmade orchestra. So you can see the, the children playing there. And this the, then after that um, <coughs> thing, uh, uh, article appeared in the newspaper, he actually found somebody to manufacture these color cords. 
And so you can see some of the other instruments that he made. This is the xylophone, the drums, the pipes, the zivers. So this, this, he was very talented at all the things he thought of. So, and you can see that color, court, color indicator in the back there. So these mm -hmm. are the instruments that he ended up making and they were actually sold in, in um, the UK. And he, he got um, a commission for, 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 the, you know, for the sale. So that's how he made his money. But then because he, while he was um, already in Weimar, he was looking at, at using these color light plays, what he'd learned for, for commercial purposes. And he designed already designed uh, an advertising apparatus in, in Germany, but then he refined this in, in, in England to actually have a, a message that came across and he took out a, uh, a patent with the, the, you can see for not only England, but also for the US. And he had found somebody to go and make this, this, um, in, this, uh, this um, apparatus, advertising or display apparatus. And, um, and so you can see that, that George Henry de Vries was going to be the one that was going to manufacture it and it was going to be everywhere. He was had, had really high hopes for this for this to be, be commercially manufactured. But of course then the war broke out. So he'd also um, uh, been doing some part-time work at the, the Dulwich Preparatory College and when they decided, when the war started, they had an ec ec evacuation camp at um, uh, Cranbrook in Kent. And you can see him here, you can see the huts in the background where the children were staying. And um, so he brought along all his little instruments and everything. And they, and this is a lovely picture of the boys playing or strumming it and um, some on their drums, some on the xylophone. So this was how he kept the, the children um, amused while they were at Kent. And he was, in, there was, he was there from right from the, till the end, from when the war started till, till something happened, of course, when, um, when Germans advanced into France and everything, they of course thought there was there were spies in in England who were helping. So in the process, on the he was captured, and I think I've got, uh, in May 1941. 40, I hope I've got the right the, the date right. Yes, and ended up first at Highton, and then at. Um, on the Isle of Man. And his daughter, Marga, was also in England. She um, sent some um, paper over and he did some, some works. And these, I think, are just what, what's, what he was doing. He'd actually been able to get, finally uh, obtain work in the United States where his friends, uh, Josef and Annie Albus were working at Black Mountain College. And um, so I think this first one here represents him going from one world to another. And then the other one jump into a new world. And this is what I like about him so much. He uses colors in an interesting way. And I think I can see the colors of the Nazi flags flag in this one here in the second one. So this is very typical of what happened. And then of course, uh, he, he actually, he, was uh, trying to get to, to Canada. He thought when he was on the Isle of Man, he thought if he gets to Canada, he can go across to the United States and take up this position at, uh, at Black Mountain College. And so he, he was actually on, on, the, on the, the, the pier ready to board the, the Andorra Star, Arandora Star. And the man before him was the last one on board which was quite lucky because we all know that the Arandora star was, was sunk not long after. And so the next ship he went on was the De Nira. So, and we've talked about his time that he was amongst, amongst those that ended up in Camp 8 at, uh, at um, 
at Hay. So now I'd like to hopefully put pass on to Chris and, and I will, he can now talk and I will uh, go through some of the, the, the images when he talks, hopefully, and, and, and the, together we can do it. Okay, Chris, it's, it's over to you. Thank you, Rosie. Uh, thank you all for joining this wonderful presentation. Uh, and I'd now like to give you some background into my grandfather's tenure at Geelong Grammar School. Uh, Ludwig's journey through life was quite amazing, starting in Germany in 1893, then going on to England in 1936. Then deportation to Australia on the ship, the Denier, as Resi's just mentioned, to internment camps at Hay and Orange in New South Wales, and finally at Tatura in Victoria. I think his story is one that is linked inextricably to the major events of the 20th century. Unexpectedly, it was in Australia that he finally found peace and fulfilment as the art teacher at Geelong Grammar School after being released from his internment at Tatura in Victoria in 1942, following an offer from, for employment from its principal, Dr. James Darling, and during his retirement at Fernie Creek in Victoria's Dandenong Ranges. Um, from his days in the Bauhaus in Germany through, through his years at Geelong Grammar School and during his retirement, Hirschfeld had engaged in exploring with others, especially with the young, the relationship of form, colour and space, of colour and music, of art and nature. Uh, there's little doubt that his contribution to art extended far beyond the physical and that his efforts in reforming art education in Victoria may well have lit the spark that led to more and more people becoming art teachers and lovers of art. Some of his notable contributions and achievements during his tenure at Geelong Grammar School included introducing wood carving, leather work, instrument making and pottery, and poster printing into the art curriculum. Pro producing a frieze of the life of Christ on the walls of the upper story art room overseeing the design and construction of a new entrance gate for the art school road and then can you go a bit slower about the freeze we'll just go through the freeze oh the, the freeze uh, yep they're good yep thank you i'll you just can... show the pictures of the freeze all right okay so this yeah, was would... done together with the students thanks rosie and this was on the upper part of the wall around the art room Okay, they're, they're sorry, the sorry. Yeah, that's all right. They're the gates I've just mentioned as well. And of course he did uh, statues and many other things around the school. Well, um, actually, can I put it back in here? These two yes, were can. done by, by Rick's, uh, Rick's Wright, who was um, one of the students. So you can see, and um, he designed the, the gates. You can see these little figures, which, which was part of his thing. He always had people hand, um, you know, holding hands, you know, in unity. So these are the, the two gates. They've been bronze now, but this it's amazing that he taught this student to actually put together, make these two, two uh, figures that go on the, the front of the art school gates. Sorry to butt in, Chris. And, uh, just here at the, the gate there, there's, there's about that size was the gate they had at their cottage at Red Row in the Dandenongs. Uh, which I eventually um, got hold of, and I now have it now have it on a, at our house in um, on the Gold Coast in Queensland, as a, as, a, as, an, as an art form outside. Okay, his teaching practices at the school were based on the Bauhaus philosophy of combining both practical trade crafts and fine arts, and include aspects of the progressive reform movement of pre-Nazi Germany. Together, these philosophies concentrated on liberating creativity, assisting students in their journey of self-knowledge, aiming for economy of material and form, and ultimately, the reform of society through art. Many students at Geelong Grammar reaped the benefit of attending and participating in his art classes. And on many, he had a lasting and positive influence. And uh, Rezi just mentioned one of the ex-Geelong Grammarians, Rick's Wright, who fondly summed up Ludwig Hirschfeld Mack with these words. As a teacher, he probably did more for his fellow man than he devoted his time to his own personal output. As a person, he was brisk, matter of fact, and scrupulously clean in his dress and appearance. He had a glowing suntan coloured skin and a very benign aura, 
one felt elevated and stimulated in his company. He was a deeply spiritual person with a great social conscience and mission to unite and better the human race. Uh, my grandfather is a great and gifted teacher endowed with a quiet but infectious enthusiasm and his capacity to enjoy life made a lasting impression on those with whom he came in contact. James Darling, the principal of the school commented, he had a great inner strength and although not formally a Quaker, had the serenity which is their mark. He loved children and was good with them, never imposing himself upon them nor patronising them. Physically strong and brave, his most obvious quality was gentleness. Creative and original himself, he never tried to impose his own style and methods upon his pupils, but encouraged them to develop their own in their own way. As an art master, not primarily concerned with presenting candidates for examinations, it was the variety of his interests and techniques as well as encouragement of those with talent and without, which made him so valuable. More than what he did was what he was in himself, his dignity, his patience, his lack of any meanness at all, and his forbearance, which made it so great a privilege to know him. That's the end of the quote from um, Sir James Darling. In spite of his humility and unassuming nature, I'm sure that my grandfather would have been proud in his own humble way that his name was given to the, new, to the new photographic facility and gallery open at Geelong Grammar School in 2003. As with the entrance gates, this facility will serve as a lasting reminder of a great human being and will ensure his important contrib contributions to our understanding appreciation of art in the widest sense are never forgotten. It could well be argued that his most profound and enduring legacy was his application of Bauhaus prin principles to the teaching and learning of the arts within initially Victorian and ultimately the Australian arts curriculum, primary, secondary and tertiary. It is very gratifying to know that Ludwig Hirschfeld Mac was and still is held in high, such high esteem by the school community. He retired from his teaching position towards the end of 1957, which provided him with the opportunity to withdraw to Fernie Creek with his wife Olive and, and accomplish the work he had wanted to do with his painting and involvement in art education. I, I'm not going to mention the book again, but it's a great read if anyone's interested. Uh, look, best wishes to you all. Thanks for being part of well, this. Can I just can I just oh, get yes, in right. there? Okay, yeah. Um, I'm just going to show. This is this is the, an example of the what what Chris was talking about with all the the different types of things. And and this was an exhibition he held in Melbourne. And 3,000 people came to it because it was something completely new that they hadn't seen in art before. So these were the Bauhaus principles we were talking about. Again, we can see the, 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 the exhibition here. This was held in Melbourne. Then as well as that, he designed the, um, the gates the, the, for the centenary. There were eight columns and he designed all of these special for the subjects that were taught. And then the last photo is, um, this is one of the few, I don't think Geelong Grammar's got any other building named after a teacher. So this has been after, named after a teacher. And we can see Catherine um, and Marga, myself and Donata, who was the guest and, and a person from Geelong Grammar. So, so um, yeah, so I just wanted to add that, that, um, and this tile path was probably that that was probably the, one of the first tile paths that was ever done uh, in Australia because they've, they're everywhere now. But but he had done these as well. So, OK, I just and wanted course, to say to thanks to Monica and. Um, yes, and thank you for the, for the opportunity to catch up with my sister on tonight um, with Renata and Michael and also. Yeah, and thank uh, you. Uh, yes. And Eva as well. <laughs> And um, this is the book, if you're ever interested, you can see it's quite a thick book. So <laughs> that's the end of that. Okay, thanks very much. Lovely, and thank you so very much. That was delightful. And um, perhaps you could stop screen sharing. Um, I can stop, yes, sorry. Yes. Uh, no, no, that's fine. Oh, how do I stop it? Wait on, I just- uh, It just on. says stop share. Stop share. Secure. Oh, here, stop video, stop. Oh, wait on now, I didn't learn this. Oh, stop, pause, share, no. Stop, so should say stop, share? <laughs> no, sorry. 
It's oh, here we are. I found it. I'm yeah, so yeah. sorry. The thing is not to panic. It's usually there. So <laughs> the I there. practiced and then I got it wrong. <laughs> no problem at all. Lovely. Well, what a rich mix of very different, but, you know, they all complement each other in very interesting and, uh, you know, informative and thought provoking sorts of ways. And um, I don't know, we have about 15 minutes to round up today's um, part of the conference. If anybody has any specific questions or indeed general thoughts and observations they'd like to uh, share with us, please um, do tell type them in. Um, I'd just like to perhaps I might turn to you Jay to give us some thoughts in relation you know the specific material we've been looking at today in relation to your broader thoughts in, in a minute but perhaps I could just um, preface that by saying that um, in this country for quite obvious reasons in 2019 as the centenary of the founding of the Bauhaus there was a lot of fuss made both of the um, achievements and also the kind of more complex nature of the German Bauhaus, but also by extension, the lesser known history of those Bauhauslers who actually came to, to these shores, to the UK. And I think some of you may be particularly interested to know of a, um, he's essentially a design historian, architectural historian called Alan Powers. I don't know whether you've come across him at all. He's a certainly a, an acquaintance, almost a, a friend of mine. Um, I've worked with him on many occasions. And indeed he gave a talk on the Bauhaus contingents um, contribution to the war effort which again is on the YouTube um, channel I've mentioned um, but he's also more importantly perhaps he's written a wonderful book called Bauhaus Goes West which is actually very largely about the influence of the Bauhaus and the you know by virtue of those who came to the UK um, in this country and then also um, slightly less focus on, on the United States as well. So it's part of this kind of broader picture that's emerging about the multifaceted nature and indeed the pervasive influence of, of the Bauhaus across, across the world. And I do wonder, you know, whether, for example, it was Gertrude, somebody I'd never heard of, Gertrude Helsker. Um, I wonder how many other people, you know, in the UK, America, wherever, indeed Germany, know, know about her. Um, Andrew, I don't know whether you want to comment on that. Uh, I don't think many people in Australia yeah. know about her. She looks, she looks interesting. Good. Yeah, there's somebody called Elizabeth Otto, who's an academic in the States, who's looked in particular yeah, yeah. at the Bauhaus women, and indeed there are others besides. It might be nice to kind of alert her. Anyway, all right. So, Jay, please perhaps round things off. I can't see any questions coming in. I suspect we're all getting a little weary. The night is drawing on for you guys uh, across the world. So, Jay, would you like to just round things off with some thoughts? You're, you're muted at the moment. Still muted? He's on mute, yeah. Oh, you're on mute, Jay. Jay, that's it. I did it. Just to start, it seems to me that the beginning and the end of our uh, day today uh, described two pathways uh, towards creativity, uh, the Kitzinger pathway um, and the, uh, the Hersfeld Mach pathway. Because it seems to me that Hersfeld Mach found a home in Australia uh, that uh, uh, distinguished him in. Uh, important ways from many of the others. It's not that they didn't uh, become Australian or become uh, proud of their uh, of their country. It, it's that there was uh, there was something. What I what I would like to say uh, spiritual about Hersfeld Mach's uh, life in in Geelong. Uh, I was very moved, as I'm sure everybody else was, by the uh, by the freezes in the. Uh, upper gallery uh, in the art department. Uh, and th this may raise an issue that what gave Hersfeld Mach his strength, among other things, uh, was his his Quaker convictions. Uh, and, and this is this is an important point because it might indicate something about his pacifism. Mm. His pacifism strikes strikes me as one of the most original aspects. Uh, Seamus will have to come in here, but. My, my guess is that he had a religious pacifism which gave him uh, a presence and, an, and, and a, was it a, a, a peace of mind, a tranquility, is that what Darling uh, called him, um, which set him apart from others. So there are two poles that come out. The first is the restlessness of the uprooted, uh, which I saw in the story of uh, Kitzinger, a very distinguished man as well, struggling to, to find a way to live both with the Hamlet within him uh, and the Faust within him. Uh, and the Hersfeld Mach, who, who, can I say this, uh, Rezi or, uh, or Chris, uh, who found a religious peace within himself? Who found, yes, he, found think, some, um, he found something powerful in his religious beliefs, which we haven't talked about. 
And well, Daniel Andrews had this lovely, uh, Daniel Thomas, who, who was uh, one of his students who became, I think he became curator at, um, at Newcastle and everything. He said he glowed like stained glass windows, which I thought was a lovely, lovely expression of, of you know, his serenity. But of course, I never got to know him. Of course, Chris has got the, the honour and so is Catherine, who's also here. Chris's sister, who and and I think Renata too have got, had the honour of actually meeting him. So I can't really say anything about it. I've just let, read his letters and everything, and and I was amazed that you know he he seemed to have a prediction of what was going to happen. He knew that um that were that the Germans were going to march into Paris, and you know even when when they gave um. Uh, Sudetenland to, to the, um, you know, when Hitler got Sudetenland in, in Czechia, he said, oh, well, he, if once he's got that, he'll want more, he'll go to Poland. So he seemed to predict things as well. So, yes, so, and, and of may course, I, he didn't may like... I, may I add yes, something? Yes, and, please. Uh, I, I come from the Frankfurt Hirschfeld family, so my, I lived together with my grandmother all my life, and my father grew up in that family, um, I think one major influence on him was his own father, Ernest Hirschfeld, who was, must have been an enormous, gentle and intelligent and witty man in all aspects, because all his children and his grandchildren seem as like the ideal father. Well, my father hadn't had a father, but he had his grandfather as a father. And my father, although not being religious, he was as a personality, he was used very close, like the one Ludwig was. So I think the importance of his family can't be underestimated in that case. The, yes, the well, he was described as one of the most contented men, wasn't he, Renata? Your, your, uh, uh, you know, his father, his Ernst, Ernst, yes. Yeah. So, do you think I, it also has something? Uh, to do with the fact that his way of making art very much in keeping with Bauhaus ideals was very much about art as an intrinsic part of the functioning of life, if you like. Whereas if you take an expressionistic view on art, it is very much about subjective expression of inner angst, often, of course, provoked by outdoor outside events. So it's a very, again, it's a very different attitude, isn't it, to creativity. And I just wonder if, if that's significant as well, perhaps. Jay, sorry, carry, carry on. No, not at all. I, I think it's, you know, it, it goes back to the, you know, Clay's views and, and Kandinsky's about the spiritual, you know, to the Blauer writer. There's, there's so many moments, but it, it seems to me the specifically Quaker element in Hirschfeldmark, the, the explicitly Protestant nature may, may enable us to address your second, uh, I think, analytical uh, contribution, Monica, which is the, th the third way between insider and outsider. Uh, there, there are people who are both and neither at the same time. And my guess is that Hirschfeld Mach was that. Uh, I, I'm not for a moment saying that he wasn't an insider. Uh, apparently, and, uh, Ken and, and Seamus and I went to Geelong Grammar School and saw the traces of the Murdoch family and so on. Uh, it's a pretty insider's place. It's... <laughs> And it's, uh, what is it, 50,000 a year? It's, uh, it's certainly not for uh, every family. But at the same time, the, it's, it strikes me that what Herschel Mach did was to bring something that was a blend of his German um, Protestant background and his artistic philosophy of life um, uh, to uh, the students in, in Geelong and, and do something that made him both an insider and an outsider at the same time. Would, would that strike you as, as true? Uh, Resi, that he was he was an insider to be sure, but not only. Yes, probably. Um, yes, he, I mean he was in a completely. Um, how would you say that? No, well, he actually had come from quite a privileged family, I think, too. But then he, he was dealing dealing with privileged boys, and I think in one letter he did write that um, you know because there were a lot of Western farmers there, and he he wrote that. Um, they weren't really that interested in art and everything. And I think the school also had a, had a thing for, for more sport, didn't it? It was, sport was very important at Geelong Grammar, as far as I could work very out. Very much so. Yeah, very much so. Mm. Yes. 
So, but he still had that serenity and, you know, to, to, to that seemed to, to be passed on to the children, to the students he had. Was he a practicing Quaker? Because of course one has to differentiate between Protestantism and Quakerism. They're not by any means well, identical. Well, he, um, Chris, correct me if I'm if I'm not incorrect. Yeah. Um, he 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 actually went his his he went to to stay with the Clarks, and they were Quakers. Mm -hmm. He had that Quaker connection. He worked with the Quakers. But he didn't really join the Quakers till what year was that, Chris? It was much later that he became one by conviction. But he, but you know, oh, not Oliver, until after he left, not till after he left the school. Yes, but he, but Olive was was a was a Quaker. The the, the yeah. lady he married later, so she was. So he was. He attended a lot of Quaker things, and and he and I think he attended attended straight after he came out of at a camp he attended Quaker functions as well and quite great Quaker meetings or Quaker services yes. really interesting because yeah. I know of some artists of Jewish yeah. background who actually became quite you know Quakers well, by Renata, Renata has something to say oh, <laughs> sorry for interfering there's something where I do not agree with your book altogether Racy. the family story was that his, his sec, Ernst Hirschfeld's stepmother was the one who insisted that the family should uh, go into Christianity to get the rights and all the, the privileges of the Christian population, not so much out of religious reasons, but just to have to take care, part in the normal bourgeois kind of living. And then my great grandfather and Sirschwald's father choose the most obscure uh, Protestantism he could find, which was the French um, Calvinistic uh, Reformed Church, because there he could not be controlled by his neighbors, whether he was going to the Catholic or the Protestant <laughs> Church. So the Protestantism in the Hirschfeld family was very um, superficial, I must say, you know, they were not Jews any longer, but they were never really None of the family I knew, and I, I've grown up in Frankfurt in, in the, really, in the, with all the, the sisters that Ludwig still had, and I knew them all, none of them were really religious, none of them were strong Protestants in their mind, and so I would be careful to put not too much religious background into Ludwig's upbringing. I don't think that wasn't the case. And that conversion to Christianity, of course, as I'm sure Jay will confirm, uh, you know, is very, very common because it was the way to enter of the mainstream. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Can I just but, also but, say, uh, perhaps just on a more, more serious and wider note, of course, the Quakers are the unsung heroes in my book anyway, and I think in many people's books, you know, still not insufficiently acknowledged the role they played in helping refugees escape from Nazi dominated Europe is, is an extraordinary one and one that needs to be acknowledged. Um, can I just say, I think there was Rachel Rachel raising her hand. Is that Rachel? Please yes. Did, did, did. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Um, you're not going to see me, but can you hear me? Oh, sorry, Rachel, not Pistol. Sorry, other Rachel. Yes, of course. Do you not uh, want to cut down on your camera again? We need to. No, no, I don't actually. So, <laughs> okay. okay. All right. <laughs> Just to complete the circle, um, I, I don't know if, if people know that my father uh, married my mother, who was herself a Quaker. Ah, so, yes. Uh, to bring the two strands, Jay, that you mentioned together, he he himself wasn't a Quaker, but he did marry a Quaker. And I think ah. one of the things that attracted him to my mother <laughs> was that sense of um, grounded peace that she emanated. So just to close the circle. <laughs> well, he, cer he certainly had the still small voice of conscience in everything mm -hmm. that he did. Yeah. <laughs> And he recognized that in her. Yeah. Lovely. I think that's a very nice point at which to, to end today's proceedings. Um, exactly. Goodness me. Exactly at one o'clock UK time. Seamus, are you impressed? I hope, <laughs> I hope so. Good. I don't know, Seamus, whether you wanted to add something by way of parting shot or whether we should leave it at that for today. Except to say thank you very much, to everyone. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Monica. That was excellent. Thank Lovely. you. Well, you know, there are many thank threads that I think we will continue to explore tomorrow. I hope, therefore, to see most of you, if not all of you, uh, tomorrow. Very good. Okay. All the very thank best. Thank you. Okay. Good night. Well, thank you. Night. Night all. Goodbye. Goodbye. Good night.